Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6763 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the future of Gaelic and Scots. I should advise members that interpretation facilities are available. Members can listen by inserting their headphones into the socket on the right hand side towards the front of the console. And any member unable to hear the interpretation should press the audio button on the console and select Channel 1 English. And I would invite members who wish to speak in, their debate, in the debate to please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to speak to and move the motion up to 15 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I move the motion in my name. It's our privilege to open a debate in the Scottish Parliament about our support for Gaelic and Scots. And at the outset, I recognise that in this Parliament there has been strong cross-party support for both languages. And I'm confident we would all agree that this needs not just to be maintained, but to be strengthened. <clears throat> As poetine Crichton-Smith said in a poem read out at the opening of the Scottish Parliament, let our three-voiced country sing in a new world. The focus of our discussions today is support for our indigenous languages, Gaelic and Scots, and these two lines express in a few words the same sentiment and share the same priorities behind the motion we are debating today. <coughs> the Scottish Government is proud of our record in supporting our languages and we recognise the cultural and the economic benefits that both Gaelic and Scots have for the whole of Scotland and the impact they have internationally. We are witnessing a growing number of young people in particular who want to embrace their languages and the Scottish Government is determined to ensure those who wish to learn and live their lives through Gaelic and Scots are afforded the opportunity to do so. We must also give those individuals the confidence to use their language without the negativity that we sometimes witness on our social media and in some sections of the press. We came to power on a manifesto which I feel demonstrates our commitment to our languages. However, it has been a number of years since legislation was passed in support of the languages and now is the time to consider how we can further strengthen the current structures. I hope today will be the first of many discussions we have on the future of our languages and I want to work with all parties right across the chamber to ensure a bright future for Gaelic and Scots. I would like to first briefly uh, refer to initiatives that are in place and the progress being made and also to the consultation paper that has been published and on which we are still open and inviting comments. <coughs> Certainly. Stephen Kerr. I think the Cabinet Secretary is right. I think it's going to be a very uh, consensual debate because I think all the parties in this Parliament are in the same place. But before she progresses much further into her speech, would she agree with me that languages in general is an area where we could do better in Scotland in terms of introducing languages to children much younger, uh, and, and, and all the way through their scholastic uh, careers in primary and secondary school. It's an area where I think together politically we should have the will together to make an improvement in our, our linguistic skills generally. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And if we can uh, begin the intervention today by me agreeing with uh, Stephen Kerr, I think we are off to a good start uh, already. Uh, but uh, the member is uh, quite correct to point to the importance um, of opening up uh, languages and the learning of languages uh, to all our young people. That's why the government has the one plus two policy to ensure uh, that languages are brought in um, to our primary schools and, and throughout the primary schools uh, to ensure that, that they are opened up to that progress. But uh, very happy, uh, perhaps in another debate, to discuss that further or indeed um, at other opportunities. <clears throat> Uh, Presiding officer, the Scots language has played a, reading, a leading role in the life of your nation, both in our past and in the present. If we look back to see Scots used in public and community life, in our literature and our songs, and if you look at our current cultural life, we still see Scots in use or in us. I'm glad to say as well that there has been mere support for Scots and mere resources make it available. The Scottish Government now has a Scots language policy, Further support for Scots can be funded in the Council of Europe's European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages and in the most hurtling information gathered through the Scots question in the last census. Scots plays a muckle part in education, publishing and the arts, and a throng of small organisations with support for the government are working together to ease up Scots in every way. The Scottish Government keens well that Scots needs mere support 
and we are increasing funding. We add it to the number of Scots bodies that are working to provide a brighter future for Scots speakers. We can see a number of Scots, particularly young folk, we are closely aligned with the Scots language and it is important that they have access to the RIC materials. By broadening access for young folk and teachers through the work of Scots House and Yaldi Books, we are doing just that. These outstanding resources are helping young folk in their attainment and their educational outcomes. And as they do, we can all agree that this is welcome. For bias, for myself, this debate means an awful lot to me. I can mind when I was growing up in Fife being told not to speak slang and to speak properly. I couldn't understand how the language I used in the playground was wrong and needed to be changed once I got into school. Thankfully, we've moved on through these attitudes and my appreciation and pride in my language has grown. I now find I'm able to use the language in my home, my bairnhead, in my community, in my duties as a Cabinet Secretary. I've seen as well many others that are using Scots with new pride and confidence, and this has to be encouraged. Up to now, the Scots language has not benefited through formal support, through legislation. But with growing support for the language, we must think about what we can do in this regard. I now turn into Gaelic, which I will not be attempting in Gaelic, presiding <laughs> officer, eh, despite my best um, efforts eh, to learn some of the language since coming into this eh, part of government. But the Scottish Government is also determined to support the Gaelic language and committed to the process of reversing how Gaelic has been viewed and treated. We are all aware of the injustices of the past and the steps taken to eradicate Gaelic. However, our aim is to create a secure future for Gaelic and Scot in Scotland, and this will be achieved by an increase in those learning, speaking and using the language. For Gaelic, important steps have been taken. Our support for Gaelic medium education has created a successful minority sector within Scottish education, operating at all levels and, the increasing, and is increasingly popular with parents. To help meet this demand, the Scottish Government has provided funding to local authorities and this continues to help widening access to Gaelic through new schools and units across Scotland. Most recently, we announced a further round of capital to local authorities, including Cornwall and Neil and Sayre, Glasgow and Highland, to grow their Gaelic provision. In recent years, we've also witnessed other local authorities start their Gaelic journey by opening units to meet demand in their areas. Most recently, Renfrewshire Council opened provision in Paisley, which has been welcomed by parents and no doubt will be a jewel in the crown for the local area when the Royal National Mod visits in 2023. And to be clear, the Scottish Government wants to build on the ambitions of local authorities and parents, and I want to work with other local authorities to help meet their particular needs. Of course, it's important to widen access so that all those who wish to learn Gaelic have the ability and the resources to do so. Through the Faster Rate of Progress initiative, we have seen the development of Speak Gaelic by MG Alpa. This multi-platform learning resource is helping build upon the massive interest created by Duolingo and will help learners reach fluency. I'm proud that the Scottish Government has been able to provide ongoing funding to this project and our support for Gaelic broadcasting has transformed the broadcasting landscape in Scotland and encouraged a minority community to have a significant impact on Scottish cultural life. We also recognise the economic and social benefits that Gaelic brings to the whole of Scotland. This is in no more evident than through the Royal National Mod, which was only debated in this chamber uh, a couple of weeks ago. This annual Gaelic Cultural Festival is open to Gaelic and non-Gaelic speakers alike and is worth on average around £2 million to the local area that hosts the 10-day event. Surely this is something that we can all be proud of. Michael Mara. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. We certainly recognise the, uh, the economic benefit of Gaelic and, uh, and Scots languages, and, and the MOD, I think, is a great example of that. But does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise as well the reliance of the Gaelic community on a functioning economy in its heartlands? And what is the Government going to do to deal with that issue to make sure that Gaelic can survive and thrive? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think is, this is uh, one of the areas that's um, in the Labour amendment, which the government would be happy to, to support um, uh, today. And I should have said, for the uh, avoidance of doubt, we're also happy to support the amendment uh, in the name of the Conservative Party too. Uh, but Michael Mara raises a, a very important point, but that's exactly why 
Cape Forbes uh, set up uh, a working group to look at uh, the wider um, aspects right across Scottish Government that impact on uh, the use of Gaelic, Gaelic communities. That uh, working group is uh, currently just completing its final uh, report uh, and obviously that will be published in due course and we can look at the recommendations uh, that come from that because Mr Mara, as I say, raises a very important point. And of course we are all aware that the traditional Gaelic speaking areas are under pressure from any outside factors as we've just uh, spoken about. These communities must be given a level of support to help them thrive and that's why the Scottish Government has provided around £500,000 over the past two years to build on the network of Gaelic development officers who work across Scotland. For the language to progress further, we need to build on the important initiatives that are in place and support the community of speakers and learners where the, wherever they are and whoever they may be. We now have the opportunity to reflect on how the Gaelic Language Scotland Act 2005, the School Consultation Act 2010 and the Education Scotland Act 2016 have operated in practice. The Scottish Government's consultation paper covers a wide ranging set of issues relating to Gaelic and Scots and in this paper there are four key commitments. They are to establish a new strategic approach to Gaelic medium education, to explore the creation of the Gaelic Act, to review the structure and functions of Board the Gaelic and to take action on the Scots language. With the Scottish Government's commitments and the work that will follow from this consultation, there is another opportunity to build on the good progress that has been made and to strengthen Gaelic and Scots in Scotland by increasing the numbers of people using these languages. This consultation exercise and the views received will be an important element to making further progress. And where primary legislation is needed, we plan to introduce the Scottish Languages Bill to Parliament and this will enable progress to be made. In the consultation exercise, we are seeking contributions from across all relevant communities and the views we receive will assist in shaping the Gaelic language plans and our plans for Scots and Gaelic in the future. As I've previously mentioned, our task is to strengthen the confidence of speakers and learners, to encourage the use of these languages and to create opportunities for their use right across the public sector, the private sector and right across our communities. I believe our consultation exercise is an important step on that journey. My officials have engaged with local communities and interest groups from right across the country, both virtually and importantly in person. We've had a good response so far to this consultation with a very wide range um, of views, but I would encourage all those with an interest to respond before the consultation closes on the 17th of November. This debate also plays an important part in that consultation. As I said in my introduction, presiding officer, we have often had a very a informative um, and very constructive debates uh, when we've discussed Gaelic and Scots in this Parliament. Uh, I certainly hope that this will be another example from that and something that the government will take exceptionally seriously as we move to analyse the consultation results and move forward with our progress for Gaelic and Scots, something that I'm sure we can provide support for right across this Parliament. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move amendment 6763.1 up to 11 minutes. Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I move the amendment in my name? And as ever, the Scottish Conservatives welcome the opportunity to take part in a debate on Scotland's languages, on Gaelic and Scots. We are Conservatives after all. Yeah, we yeah. believe in conserving things and conserving our heritage in particular. And on a personal level, as someone who strongly supports the need to protect, preserve and promote all of Scotland's languages. I take a very keen interest in this issue, especially when it comes to Gaelic. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the consensual approach being taken today. She was right to acknowledge the cross-party support. And we will support both the Government's motion and Labour's amendment uh, in any event. Uh, in order for all of Scotland's minority languages to survive and grow, this Parliament must continue to be united in its endeavour to deliver on the promises that we make. And that's especially true in the case of Gaelic, which faces many existential threats, which I will return to later, and which will form the predominant part of my speech. Um, but the Scots language is crucially important too. It's not in the same perilous position as Gaelic, given its many variations are spoken over by over 1.5 million people across Scotland. But we must not rest on our laurels here either. And as we look to the uh, proposed Scottish Languages Bill, we have to ensure that legislation addresses the threats to Gaelic, 
but that we also learn from past mistake, mistakes so that Scots too remains prevalent. Scots is, of course, made up of various regional languages, including Border Scots and Doric, to name but a few, and I can't help but mention my former colleague, Peter Chapman, who is a champion of Doric yeah, in this yeah, chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, these languages have evolved over time, and in many cases, people merge Scots with Gaelic, and the Scottish Arts Council has supported various bodies, including the Scots Language Centre and the Scots Language Dictionary, for example, as well as other cultural organisations who rightly promote Scots as part of their work. And so to Gaelic, it's right to begin by acknowledging the many good things that are happening, especially in the media and in the arts, notably the ongoing success of Fashion and Gale and the work of M.G. Alibo, already mentioned. It's also particularly positive that in recent years, Gaelic has gained an ever higher status within the academic community, with the University of the Highlands and Islands playing a leading role. Researchers are active both on campus and in many Gaelic-speaking communities. And we even see technology playing a part. The Gaelic Algorithmic Research Group at Edinburgh University has been develop de developing an automatic speech recognition system for Gaelic, which can automatically transcribe Gaelic speech into writing and is, for instance, particularly helpful for Gaelic speakers who struggle with dyslexia. We should also mention that 1.4 million people subscribe to Learn Gaelic on the Duolingo app, mm -hmm. around 80% of whom are based in Scotland. Now, these are all good news stories to celebrate, but we come to this chamber again and again to... to, to yes, of course, yeah. Emma Harper. I thank Donald Cameron for taking an intervention. You mentioned Duolingo. There isn't a Duolingo for Scots, so would you encourage maybe a Duolingo being created to help folks speak Scots better? Donald Cameron. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, I would support that. And um, I, I just re regret that my technical ability in terms of that endeavour is probably fairly limited. But um, <laughs> of course I accept that from Emma Harper. But these are all good news stories to celebrate. But we do come to this chamber, I feel, again and again to debate Gaelic and very little changes. We've had many debates here where there have been lots of, rightly, lots of warm words, but precious little action. Let there be no doubt, Gaelic is in crisis and we are running out of time. It will die out if we do not do more. Back in 2018, UHI published its long-awaited report, The Gaelic Crisis in the Vernacular Community, and its findings were sobering. It found that the social use and transmission of Gaelic was at the point of collapse in its traditional heartlands. According to its researchers, researchers there were only 11,000 habitual speakers of Gaelic left. And even more worrying was the finding that there is general, quote, indifference among the young regarding the place of Gaelic in their lives. In his introduction to Anne Toole, the magisterial collection of Gaelic poetry, the editor, Ronald Black, noted the Gaelic revival in the final quarter of the last century, but he stated the revival took place in education, the mass media, and various forms of prose, not in its use as a community language, and not in poetry. Now, that was published in 1999, the same year that the Scottish Parliament was reconvened, and no doubt hopes were high that under devolution, a revival would gather pace. But the fatal flaw was that the revival was not taking place in the Gaeltoch, and was not sufficiently rooted among young people. And so the challenge remains, and if anything, it's more daunting than it was two decades ago. Now, many of us in this chamber, uh, across uh, this chamber, feel a very strong sense of duty to ensuring the survival and growth of Gaelic. But it's one thing to will on the language, quite another to have pragmatic solutions to achieve this. First and foremost, we require a more subtle approach than simply investing money at the issue in the hope that a mere injection of funds will alone solve the problems. Preserving a language, and by extension a culture, simply doesn't work like that. There is also, uh, that is also in part the danger of bringing forward more legislation. Now we will of course engage with the government on this bill to ensure that it has the best chance of delivering real and lasting change, but on its own, it will not save the language. That has to come through community engagement within the wider uh, Geltoch. It's also right that we depoliticize the debate around Gaelic and Scots and that we challenge those who try to do so. And I wrote about this in 2018. I said that too often debates about Gaelic, especially online, descend into proxy battles over completely unrelated issues, the Constitution being a particular culprit, particularly on social media. And I said that 
Gallic is frequently appropriated as a quasi-nationalist cause on the one hand or attacked by unionist ultras on the other. I said then we all need to, to tone down the rhetoric and I remain of that view. It's a language, not a political football. Yeah, yeah. Like Scots, it's one of our national languages. It's quintessentially part of our country. In the words of the Scottish Land League and the West Highland Free Press, and cheer and canon snodonia. The land, the language, the people. All are intertwined. Just as everyone in Scotland can lay claim to Scottish nationhood, just as everyone in Scotland can lay claim to our national heritage, so can everyone in Scotland lay claim to Gaelic and Scots. They have iconic status as national languages. They belong to us all. And the celebration of both are also clues to Scottish identity itself and the vast concurrence of distinct national and regional identities within Scotland and within the UK. So let's not reduce this debate, important debate, to one about whether or not bilingual road signs or Gaelic words on police cars should exist. That's a diversion from the urgency of this debate. Now, I, for one, believe that it's a good thing that public sector organisations across Scotland have Gaelic language policies embedded within their, within their structures and their output. But we also have to recognise that a top-down approach won't necessarily work because ultimately it will be communities that determine whether Gaelic remains a living and dynamic language. And that means engaging younger generations as well as investing in campaigns aimed at reviving Gaelic at its grassroots and among the people who currently speak or learn it. And with that in mind, I agree with the government's uh, motion that there should be a review of the structure and functions of Board and Gaelic. Now, these benches have a very positive relationship with the Board and its leadership, and I support the work that it does do to promote Gaelic. But it's not a view that's universally shared by my constituents that I have met in recent years, or at least some of them. And an ongoing review to maintain the positive work that the Board does, but also identifying areas of improvement is right and proper. There is also an urgent need to improve access to Gaelic in our schools, and this is the subject of, of our amendment. Now, members may be aware of a report recently presented to the Scottish Government by Dr. Michael Foxley and Professor Bruce Robertson, both very prominent and respected individuals in the Highland firmament. Uh, that report focused on the pressing need to address the shortage of Gaelic medium education teachers to meet the increasing demand across Scotland. And it goes without saying that GME has been a success story, and this report acknowledges that, but notes its, and it particularly notes its particular success in early years and primary education. But it also highlights the stark challenges that exist for GME at present and in the future. Ongoing uh, unfilled teacher vacancies, the lack of cover for absent teachers with no GME supply teacher availability, the inability of local authorities to provide a meaningful GME curriculum, in secondary schools. And it states that the new problems that may arise could include the fact that uh, as a result of the new national contract, uh, there might be a reduction to 21 hours per week of class contact, and that will require at least a 7% increase in GME teacher numbers. The most striking aspect of that report is the fact that it estimates that a minimum of 420 primary teachers and 228 secondary teachers will be needed nationally over the next five years to meet GME demand. And that's a significant challenge. We have to achieve it if we are to grow the number of Gaelic speakers. That report uh, concludes with eight recommendations. There's one that I would actively encourage uh, the Scottish Government to adopt. I hope they adopt all of them. But one of their recommendations is to set up a task force to oversee a GME workforce planning project that will report very quickly in the next six months. Can I urge, plead even, with the Cabinet Secretary to set that up? and to take um, cognizance of the report's recommendations. Now, I've spoken at length, uh, presiding officer, about the challenges facing Gaelic. That's in large part because it continues to face uncertainty, especially in the region that I represent. It is the language of my forefathers, and one that I feel passionate about. And it's crucial we do everything we can to support both Gaelic and Scots. We need to identify and remedy the challenges facing Gaelic. There's so much we can do, but there's only so much government can do, and we must recognize that communities are the key for both Gaelic and Scots in the future. That means ensuring our schools can meet increasing demand. It means protecting cultural investment, supporting the fantastic organisations, such as the Common, the Gaelic, the Fet the Face Movement, the MOD. And it means ensuring government and its agencies proactive engage with the community. I firmly believe that we can do all this and more to secure a future for all of Scotland's languages. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call on Michael Mara to speak to and move Amendment 6763.2. Around nine minutes, please, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Uh, Scottish Labour, of course, support all of Scotland's uh, languages. A, a personal note, as others have, Scots played a very significant part in my upbringing and the culture um, of my family. And I felt uh, quite well qualified to translate the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's speech from my Geordie brethren here uh, on my right. So, so thank you for that. I would also uh, associate uh, Scottish Labour's concerns with Stephen Kerr's point regarding uh, the, the drop, in fact, in uh, modern language teaching in our schools, a huge drop in German, French and Spanish reported this year, an 18 per cent drop in modern language teachers. When we consider the broad applicability and use of, um, of languages and the skills that come from learning languages, we should consider that in the rounds. Uh, my my uh, speech today will focus uh, mainly on Gaelic, uh, given the urgency of the issues that surround that. And we have to recognise that over the past 40 years, Gaelic has had the support from all political parties and is very important that it stays that way. So the biggest channel of growth for Gaelic medium education was through the regional councils in Scotland, like Strathclyde and Lothian in the 1980s and 1990s. Labour initiated the process that led to BBC Alba and signed up to the European Charter for Minority Languages and the responsibilities that that brought with it. And of course, the Gaelic Language Act went through Holyrood under the Labour-led administration in 2005. Uh, and beyond the communities that speak the language daily, the importance of the language of Gaelic to our Scottish culture is immeasurable. Whether that be in music, literature, or through the broader arts, writers like Ian Crichton Smith and Sorley Maclean are staples in the canon of Scottish literature. And the Maud and the Celtic Connections highlight to us non gales the power of music from these Gaelic communities. It's central to what our country was, it's vital to who we still are, but at great risk when we consider what we might become. And the urgent concern now is that much of the impetus that we have seen in the past to support the language has been lost. So in a recent paper, Malcolm McLean, former Director General of the National Gaelic Arts Agency, asked these questions. How did we get here? How was the success of Gaelic development strategy in the 1990s in terms of education, the media, the arts and the economy become a 21st century crisis in Gaelic's Hebridean heartlands? Have the government agencies responsible for Gaelic culture been oblivious to the deteriorating situation on the islands, or have they known but opted for a state of denial? These are really the questions which this debate must address, rather than retreating into smug self-congratulation. Anybody who denies that, language is, that the language is at a critical point, even in these places regarded as heartlands, is deluding him or herself. Do not take my word for it. The major piece of research entitled The Gaelic Crisis in the Vernacular Community, published last year, spelt out the unavoidable evidence that, and I quote, the Gaelic speaking community is no longer sustainable under current circumstances and policy provision. It is really that report we should be debating today rather than self-congratulation. And I do feel, although we will vote for much of it today, what is a largely delusional motion. Every minority language needs a home, and the real danger is that there will, within a couple of decades, be no community left, where Gaelic is the language of the majority or even a substantial minority of the population. That does not need to be the outcome. But it is, if it is to be avoided, then there must be a far greater focus on the Gaelic-speaking areas that goes beyond the classroom by supporting the use of Gaelic in the community in as many contexts as possible. That's where the work of Borna Gaelic needs to be concentrated with great urgency and prioritisation of resources. The consultation paper talks about defining Gael talk areas in order to give them support. However, the last thing, uh, President Officer, that Gaelic needs is a long drawn out bureaucratic exercise around definitions. It's not difficult to identify the areas where there is still a significant Gaelic speaking population. They urgently need development workers and support for local initiatives. Whether or not they need to be formally identified as Gael talk areas is a secondary question which should not delay action by a single day. And it is impossible to separate language decline from the wider issues of depopulation and its causes. Without people, there is no language. And the fact that population continues to decline in the Gaelic communities without any effective interventions from the Scottish Government is critical to this debate. We have to consider social infrastructure and the declining resilience of Gaelic communities, so much more exposed to the economic incompetence of this Government than they would have been a generation ago. 
Take, for example, the crisis already highlighted in the teaching of Gaelic in schools due to a shortage of new teachers. A recent report suggests that over the next five years, a minimum of 225 teachers would be needed to meet demand. It, but alarmingly, only 25 qualified for the whole of this year. The scale of that crisis cannot be understated. But it's not just the education that needs to be tackled, it's the wider issues faced in the economy of Gaelic-speaking communities. In the words of Corla Nail and Shah, the success of the economy of the Western Isles is dependent on a modern, efficient air and transport network. That's something that we discuss regularly in this chamber. And that, but the Council it made those remarks in the context of the two ferries being delayed and by nearly five years, and the older ferries in the Calmac fleet in frequent breakdown. The Harris Transport Forum has warned this government that across the Western Isles, businesses are at the point of extinction. This represents, presiding officer, grotesque failure, and it only lies at this government's door. The fractures in the sea transport network to the islands is leaving food shelves bare and people unable to reach the islands. Fifteen years ago, island life economies were less reliant on these connections. There have been local ideas to address this issue, such as the Outer Hebrides food growing strategy, and those are the kind of uh, projects that need support from ministers also. Presiding officer, uh, the list of the failures in policy for Gaelic-speaking communities does go on. The breakdown of crofting regulation, the delays in extending reliable broadband provision, housing policies, or the lack of them, which push families out of the villages, all of these are contributors to the decline of communities where Gaelic is still strongest. The language does not exist in isolation. To, just today, the director of the, the University of the Highlands and Islands Language Sciences Institute warns all of us that Gaelic language promotion in Scotland has been overly concerned with issues of the symbolic status of the language to the detriment of protecting existing communities of speakers, particularly in island communities. So we need to hear from the Education Minister what actions are being taken to address the shortfall in Gaelic medium teachers. And we also need to know why is there no job dispersal strategy to bring well-paid public sector jobs involving the use of Gaelic into communities where the language is spoken. These are not issues that need to wait for legislation, but they do need practical actions now. In a few years' time, it will be too late. Labour has nothing but goodwill towards the Scots languages which are spoken in varying forms around the country, and we will look very closely at whatever proposals come forward from the government. But the needs are different from those of Gaelic, and we should not fall into the trap of contrived equivalence. Both should be respected on their own merits. President officer, I want to end my contribution to today's debate with a reflection from one of the Gaelic language's most notable writer and poets, Ian Crichton-Smith, the great Lewis poet, in a Gaelic that, as the Cabinet Secretary, I will not dishonour, uh, wrote, this is my true language, the one that suits this land, the one that makes local conversation. Smith's words tell us that Gaelic language is Gaelic life. Not a symbol to be promoted, but a culture to be saved. The reality now, presiding officer, is that more and more people can no longer afford that life or find that an island life that works for, has, for them has been stolen. With only self-congratulation and total opposition to what is actually happening in homes and communities, we stand precariously at the beginning of the end of something very precious. Thank you, Mr. Mara. I now call on Willie Rennie. Around six minutes, please, Mr. Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Even though I don't speak Gaelic, I do value the language and what it brings to our character, our culture, our heritage and our economy. And it's why I speak in support of it today. It's been under pressure over centuries on legal, social, education and economic fronts. Legal because often the government of the day sought to quell the language as a means to control the population. Economic, because to get a job, especially if you moved, you needed to speak English. Education, because it was expected in school that you would speak English, not the Gaelic. And social, as because people became more mobile, English has become the dominant language in social circles. So the language was almost underground, considered inferior by both government, but also by society. And thank goodness that has changed, not for, just for the Gales, but also for Scotland as a whole. It's no longer suppressed by the state, 
is officially recognised and supported. There is an economic value in the language as people need it for jobs and it attracts tourism, music and culture. We see that with the Royal National Mod, with MG Alba, which leads to a GVA of £17.2 million. Pounds. The Glasgow Gaelic economy is apparently worth £21 million pounds and 700 jobs. Between 2018 and 2021, there was a 72% increase in the number of Visit Scotland users visiting Gaelic-related content. There are Gaelic medium schools, and they are spreading across the country, so valued by parents, guardians and pupils alike, there is a high demand for them. Governments of all colours and political parties are fully in support, as we've heard today. But there is still a crisis, a massive crisis, and it is in social circles that it suffers. We know that the number of people who speak Gaelic at home, in the shop or in the pub, is not high. It's in decline. Whether it's confidence or habit, it's not an everyday occurrence. And Michael Marra is absolutely bang on by talking about the economic housing issues that are directly related to the well-being of the language. But what do we do? And I accept the point that Donald Cameron uh, has made, that this has to be a grassroots growth rather than a top-down instruction for people to speak the language. But government has to take action, it has to take a lead, it has to take a role in order to encourage that community action and growth. Which is why I support some of the proposals that are discussed in the consultation around about the Gale tag for a designated area for the higher proportion of Gaelic speakers. This can't just be a bureaucratic process. And I'm afraid the discussion so far within the consultation document is just that. It needs to be firm but sensitive action. And I would target the area for now. I know there's a discussion about having the whole of Scotland as a, a Gale tag. But we need to focus on the areas where it would be more naturally spoken in the home. And that's why I would focus to make sure we target our efforts to make sure those efforts are not spread too thinly. There may also be different solutions for different parts of the country. So let's start with the strongest area and build from there. Through local planning and decision making in the Highlands and Islands, we could implement policies such as whether all schools should be Gaelic medium education and whether the public sector organisations should be bilingual. It's quite a shift, but with care and good planning, it could be the shift that we need to ensure community use of Gaelic is embedded in daily life. I support the further advancement of Gaelic medium education, but as opportunities in the Central Belt and other parts of Scotland increase for those teachers, we need to make sure that schools, especially in the islands, are able to attract those teachers too. It would be tragic if the very areas that have kept the language alive through the dark decades lost out because it is now flourishing everywhere else. I would want to explore extending the rights of parents to request early years and secondary Gaelic medium education provision. I support the review of the functions of Board of Gaelic and also a greater, sharper focus on plans, targets, functions, education authorities, workforce plans and measuring progress. I support the enhancement of Scots. It's an important part of our culture and certainly my heritage too. I was reading back the official report from the passing of the 2005 Act and was struck by the powerful contribution from a Conservative Lord James Douglas Hamilton. He was explaining the role of his ancestor, Selkirk of Red River, who chartered ships following Culloden to transfer a thousand struggling Gaelic-speaking Highlanders from Skye and Rassie to Prince Edward Island in Canada. He concluded, we have no power to amend the wrongdoings of bygone centuries that led to emigration. We do not need to dwell on the other side of sorrow. But we can, at the very least, give strong support and encouragement to those who speak our country's largest indigenous language after England. Much progress has been made, 
there has been an improvement in policy over those 17 years following that act. But we should acknowledge that we should never settle, that there is a crisis, which is why we need a Scottish Languages Bill, combined with renewed support and encouragement, which should be a priority for this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. Uh, we will now move to the open debate, uh, speeches of around six minutes, and I would advise that at the present time there is some time in hand should members wish to take and or receive interventions. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Myrtle Fraser. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. As a co-convener of the Scots Lead Cross Party Group with my colleague Jackie Dunbar, MSP, I am awfully chuffed to be speaking here today, and I'm going to focus my contribution on Scots I want to see legislation endorsing the Scots lead, and I threep that we need an act of the Scots lead. The Scots lead is mighty important as part of our Scotland's cultural hairship, kith and sang, poems and literature, and in ilk a day we yeas and in our communities forby every day. The 2011 census speared a question and then the Scots lead for the first time. One and a half million folk reported that they could speak Scots, and 1.9 million cumulatively reported that they could speak, read, scrive, or understand Scots. And I look for it to the results of the most recent census, and I deluse, presiding officer, that these numbers will be mere. And to see all the numbers of our folk who I speak, read, scrive, and understand Scots. Scots isn't just a collection of regional dialects. There is muckle history of this now evolving lead. Here's a wee quote from Scots screever, TV presenter and broadcaster, Alistair Heather. The Scots of Kent that they had their own lead for the last 600 years. It's only in the last 40 that they've forgotten it. The activists for Scots will mark sicker that where words will be shared in our ways. And, as I said, songs, poems, essays, and on the telly, radio, social media, and across the internet in money forms. Presiding officer, here in Scotland, we have soons in place names and people's names that didn't match the spellings. Colleen, Colleen Castle, it's spelt Colzine. Mingus, spelt Menzies. Cargunion, which is a village near Dalbiti, spelt Cargunzion and DL, which is spelt Dalzeel. These are all currently misspelled because they contain the letter Yoch. The letter Yoch is the 27th letter of the Scots alphabet, and it has been lost its tint. The Yoch was replaced by the Z or the Y by early printers. So at some point in the future, we should correct this muckle mistake and bring back the letter Yoch, presiding officer. And as we've heard, Scots is our home language. It's one of the three languages in use in Scotland today. Words in Scots by the likes of Robert Burns, Walter Scott and Hugh McDermott are screed on the funds or the was, the foundations of this very building. Scots words are literally hodding up our national parliament. The Scots Language Centre, Stand Up for Trad, the Scots Language Awards, Wee Windies, Our Vice, Scots Hoose and ambassadors like Lenny Penny, Emma Gray, Billy Kay and my pal Susie Briggs for Galloway. She's a broad st storyteller, presiding officer. And there's a sick few mayor. They help to widen access to Scots. Ah, these folk and mayor are doing fantastic work and they need support. It. In session four of this parliament, Rob Gibson, MP, MSP, convened the Scots Lead Cross Party Group, which created the Statement of Principles to advance Scots. And as the statement of principles says, nobody should be penalised or pit and doon for speaking Scots. There are 13 statements of principles here in Rob's We Read book. Some of these principles are being addressed anew. Some haven't yet, though. Number five in the statement of principles shows that the Scots lead must receive mere funding and investment. Currently, the Scottish Government provides £480,000 in funding each year for the Scots lead, compared with £29.6 million, which was spent on Gaelic. In no way am I saying, presiding officer, that Gaelic isn't important. It absolutely is. Across Scotland, we have money historic ties to Gaelic, including place names in Galloway, in Dufries and Galloway, where I'm from. 
But my ask of the Cabinet Secretary is to increase the, the funding for the Scots Lead to secure its future. I hope that this can be addressed in the legislation as we are moving for it. Presiding officer, the consultation referred to by Money Folk and the Cabinet Secretary of the day, which I encourage folk to hear their say on, you have until midnight on the 17th. It provides an exciting opportunity to create a sustainable future for Scots. We need we are need to enhance the work of the Scots organisations. We need to bolster the use of Scots in education and we need to invest in Scots to mark sicker its future. Pursuing an act of the Scots lead is key to helping deliver the recognition that activists have been working on for money a year. The Scots lead activists are doing a phenomenal job and, and an act and a funding support is crucial to deliver education and awareness in Scots. As the old Scots saying goes, tack tent or it's tint, take care or it's lost, presiding officer. So in closing, presiding officer, I ask if the Cabinet Secretary will comment on whether a board Gaelic equivalent for the Scots lead is needed or will the existing established bodies, sick like the Scots Language Centre, can that be a vehicle to continue to deliver as it's currently doing? And again, I welcome this debate and I look for it to Ilka other contributions, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Harper. I now call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to contribute to this debate around the future of two, Scotland's two Indigenous languages. Now, growing up in the Highlands, my cultural background was always in Gaelic rather than Scots. Indeed, it was always famously said that people in Inverness spoke the finest English that could be found anywhere. Uh, deemed to be the case because it was a town originally of Gaelic speakers who learned pure English directly. And there was no great tradition of Scots uh, language, as was the case in many other parts of the Lowlands. My knowledge of Scots came from school, reading the poems of Robert Burns, and more particularly the novels of Walter Scott, which Emma Harper has just uh, mentioned. It's always uh, been, in my view, a great pity that Scots prose style is deemed too flowery for modern tastes, as he is the greatest Scottish author of all time. Language society is a superlative storyteller, and novels like Ivanhoe, Rob Roy, and The Fair Maid of Perth have tremendous plots, great believable characters who leap from the page, and they're all rooted in real history, mostly of Scotland, but also uh, of uh, England too, in the case of Ivanhoe. And although Scott's novels are written in English, many of his characters in them, of course, speak in Scots, like Wandering Willie in Red Gauntlet, whose tale of Steenie Stevenson's encounter with the devil must be the finest and certainly the most chilling Scottish short story ever written. But I'll let uh, others... Uh, yes, of course, encounter with the devil. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, if you name him, he appears. Um, I thank the member for, for giving way on, on that basis. Um, and I agree with, with really much of what he says. Um, given the importance of Scott and, and much else in Scottish literature that he rightly mentions, uh, would you agree that it should be a right of every child going to school in Scotland to learn about Scottish literature and not merely left to the enthusiasm of individual teachers, whether they are or not? Yeah. Murdo Fraser? Well, that's a very interesting point for Mr Allen, and probably we need a longer debate. I, mean, I think we need to be very careful about prescribing in our schools exactly what uh, is taught in different classes and whether or not uh, individual pupils and heads should have the... The, the right to make these choices rather than have a set curriculum that every pupil has to learn. So although I, I share his ambition that Scottish pupils should, should read uh, Scottish writers, I, I just would be nervous about too much top-down prescription. But perhaps we can extend that debate on another occasion. So I was um, very pleased to lead a members' debate just three weeks ago, celebrating the success of the Royal National Mod in Perth and paying tribute to Anne Cumin Gaelic for not just organising the Mod and making it such a success every year, but also for all the work they do in promoting the Gaelic language. And we should also recognise the work that Bordna Gaelic is doing in supporting uh, the language too. And it is certainly true that there is strong cross-party support for Gaelic, as we've already heard in this debate. It was back in the 1990s that the then Conservative government provided the financial support to create the Gaelic Broadcasting Committee, which led to the launch of BBC Alba. 
Since then, successive governments, both the Labour Liberal Democrat coalition and then the SNP government here, have continued with that tradition, and that is very much to be welcomed, because Gaelic belongs to us all. The most recent census data we have on Gaelic comes from 2011, which at that point showed that just over 87,000 people had some Gaelic language skills. We, of course, still await the results of this year's census, but I fear the numbers will show a drop since then. The news may not all be bad, with the recent social, uh, Scottish Social Attitudes Survey showing that the number of Scots who can speak some Gaelic has doubled in the past decade. But overall, I think Donald Cameron is correct when he says the Gaelic is in crisis. Uh, and I think we will see when the census comes, comes out. There are some very worrying statistics there. There has been a growth in Gaelic medium education, popular with parents, even with those who have no Gaelic background themselves. This is a success story we should celebrate, but not one which is unqualified. I know of parents groups in different parts of Scotland who would very much welcome the opportunity uh, of Gaelic medium education, but it is not currently available to them. And I'd like to see the Scottish Government doing more to encourage local authorities who do not provide GME where there is demand to make sure that it is available. I have, for example, heard from parents in Dundee that they would welcome Gaelic uh, medium education in that city but currently there is no provision. Perhaps that is an issue the Cabinet Secretary could address in her closing uh, remarks. And we also have, as Donald Cameron has highlighted, uh, indeed uh, Michael Mara, uh, serious issues with the recruitment of Gaelic medium teachers. The study last month by Dr Michael Foxley and Professor Bruce Robertson found that we will need 225 teachers over the next five years, but only 25 qualified this year. In their view, that is a crisis. So we need to look at how attractive teaching as a profession is and how we, attract, how we might attract more of those with Gaelic language skills into it. Having a demand for Gaelic medium education amongst parents and pupils is one thing, but it would be a tragedy if Gaelic continues to, to decline because we cannot meet that demand. And I seriously hope that cannot be addressed, that can be addressed. Now, young people learning Gaelic and being educated through a Gaelic medium provides great hope for the future. But they will only be of lasting value if there are opportunities to use the language in the rest of their lives, at home, in education, in the workplace. Gaelic should not become an academic museum piece like Latin or ancient Greek. It needs to be a language that should be alive and spoken daily. Now, people sometimes will ask the question, why should we waste money on Gaelic if it is a dying language? What is the point of putting taxpayers' money into keeping it alive? But my answer to that question is very simple, because it is part of the richness and diversity of our culture as a country. While it might make life easier for some, I wouldn't want to live in a world where we all speak the same language, we all eat the same food, we all wear the same clothes, we all hold the same views. What makes the world such an intriguing and interesting place is that we have such a diversity of cultures, of languages and of opinions. By investing and in supporting Gaelic, or for that matter Scots, we can play a small part in keeping the tapestry of human life as colourful as possible instead of simply being monochrome. I hope that is an ambition that unites all of us in this chamber. And on that basis, I'm very happy to support the government motion and my colleague Donald Cameron's amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Uh, I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Jack and DeBar. And when calling Dr. Allen, I would point out that I understand Dr. Allen will be making his contribution in Gaelic and that should members wish to avail themselves of the simultaneous translation, they should... Thank you, presiding officer. One of these days, I will stand up in this chamber and speak in Gaelic about health services or the Ukraine. To tell the truth, I have tried to do something along those lines a couple of times in the past at question time in Parliament. Afterwards, people have invariably asked me questions like, why do you speak in Gaelic? We weren't speaking about the subject of Gaelic today. Indeed, some still ask various questions about Gaelic that they would never think of asking about English. Nobody asks what the public services delivered th through the medium of English cost in Scotland. In English medium schools, health services in English, English road signs 
And before that point is seized on, let me say I make no complaint about such services in English. Yet, these questions are reserved specially for such services when they are delivered when they are delivered in Gaelic. Although the majority, as close to a hundred percent, as makes no statistical difference, of these services are delivered in English. Even in the islands, the majority of public services are delivered through English. We all regularly agree about Gaelic, and and it's good that that is agreed. That, as everyone today said. It is that Gaelic is precious and that it is an important part of our culture, our music and history. But Gaelic is something else too. It is a language. No language dwells in some silent theoretical place somewhere else. A language is spoken and heard and seen. People will use it even if there sometimes happen to be others nearby who may not know their language. That is a normal situation with many other languages in many other countries. That is the mainstream, as they say. So, I hope that this new bill will create new opportunities so that Gaelic will be heard and used more frequently so that Gaelic will be in the mainstream and that we might reach a more normal situation where more parts of the public and private sectors provide services in Gaelic to the many types of community in which the demand exists to speak or to learn the language I speak now. I ruse some folk when I mind them at this place wasn't it invented out of nothing at all, 20 years sign but I didn't mean to fash them. Of course, speaking Scots in here, their days, can be an unchancy business. Looking at evidence for the last wee whiley, I doubt what I'm doing right now means that I'll be trolled by all manner of folk its opinions I didn't muckle care about. At the very least, I can mark you a short leap now in the newspapers that'll cry me El Maynard or Donnert or Warner Thorn. There isn't the time today to hook far and yoch Ben into the national psychology to explain all I don't. However, just as I did with Gaelic the New, rather than speak about specific policies of the bill, I deluse that most of my speech would be better used just ettling at something else. Myth busting. Scots doesn't really form ert nor pair to the linguistic tradition of the place abide new, the Western Isles, but it does of the place I come from, the borders. I'm speaking more or less, I was speaking more or less, more or less standard Gaelic uh, uh, in my speech. Gaelic, like most Leeds, has sundry spoken dialects for by a scribe at standard. Dinna lippin' on on anybody that tells you that it's just Scots that does that. See, I'll try to use as near to a standard Scots as exists. However, if we was all agreed for me to use border Scots, I'm sure I could oblige you. I'm sure uh, I'd be more as happy to say the numbers ain, twa, and echt as yin, twe, and eight. <laughs> but two or three minutes isn't enough to get yoke it, though, to the work of myth busting around Scots. My brush Ablin seems braid enough to be a bism, but let me just tuck on a nori to touch on a point that Mr. Cameron rightly uh, brought up. Um, I ken it uh, in the media while some folk uh, runs a Scots miles through the Scots language their days because they see it as some kind of Trojan horse, or at the very least a Trojan cuddy, for your political point of view. It isn't it. Sir Walter Scott, it was, uh, his name was brought in by the log in the horn, a wee bit of sign. Sir Walter Scott was a, a political unionist and John Buchan was a Tory peer. It didn't hinder them for screaming as Scots. Say, so Aubrey can keep a calm political sooth. But, presiding officer, I am just old enough to mind on seeing a teacher spear a laddie at the skill if he had done his punishment exercise and sign convert the sentence to the taws when he got the answer back, aye. I hope I'm young enough, presiding officer, to see a Scotland where both Scots and Gaelic... I'd like to thank the government for the work they're doing for Scots and Gaelic in this bill. 
started doing the own road. Officer, I would like to thank the government for the work they are doing for Gaelic and Scots in this bill. Thank you. Dr Allen, I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm just fair tricket to speak in this debate today and like my fellow convener of the Scots lead CPG Emma Harper MSP, I want to use my time to focus on the Doric and Scots lead and I agree with Arthur that Emma said in her contribution. Presiding officer, a lead Max Falk, a common lead brings us all together and a country's lead shapes its culture. Scots, Doric, Gaelic, they've all made us far we are the day and they have to be a pair to our future and all. In my own education, like the Cabinet Secretary, I was constantly told to speak English and name my own language. So I want to touch on attainment in education the day. The Curriculum for Excellence marks clear that the languages, dialects and literature of Scotland provide a rich resource for bairns and young folk to learn about Scotland's culture, identity and language. Through engaging with a wide range of texts, they will develop an appreciation of Scotland's literary and linguistic heritage and its indigenous languages and dialects. And I'd be awful grateful if the Cabinet Secretary would confirm that Doric texts will be equitable to Scots. This educational principle permeates the experience and outcomes and is expected that our teachers will build upon a diversity of language represented within the communities of Scotland valuing the languages which bairns and young folk bring to the school. More than 50% of folk in Aberdeen and the Shire speak Doric or Scots, so it's important to ensure that folk in the region are supported to use their own mother tongue. Especially for our young folk, promoting their own language is just so important in education. Martin Whitfield, of course. Um, I'm very grateful to Jackie Dunbar giving way. And on that very important point about our young people and across a number of speeches today, um, would you like to comment on the importance of modern technologies grasping Scots and Gaelic so that our young people see it in a format which they are perhaps better suited to use than perhaps some of us are across this chamber, including myself? Jackie Dunbar. I thank the member for the question. I also thank the member for understanding what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> Absolutely uh, agree with him, especially we, uh, the Doric, which is a form of Scots. It's sometimes often difficult to write down what you're trying to say. So I, I absolutely agree with, with what you're saying just now. The Scottish Qualifications Authority has confirmed the use of Scots in education and it tackles the, the attainment gap by allowing, allowing students to speak in their own voice. Also, bilingualism has many other educational benefits and promoting Scots bilingualism assists in the government's in and twa language policy goal. Fundamentally, promoting Scots and Doric in education is about building a parity of esteem over our language so that it is thought to in equal terms with other European languages. It's about showing our bairns and, and young folk that it is okay, it's all right to use their own language. It's nae slang. It's nay inferior to English, and it's a language and its use needs to be promoted and protected. Presiding Officer Doric has rules, has got vocabulary, and its speakers hear a certain way of looking at the world that gings we only language. If you lose only language or lose only aspect of the language, you lose something that is unique. Many folk associate Doric with humour, and rightly so, as there's a great tradition of self-aware humour right across the North East. But if it is only seen through this lens, the power and status of the language is soon undermined. As my colleague Emma Harper said, Scots, like a Doric, is often seen as a non-professional language. And we need to overcome these barriers and normalise the use of Scots Doric, not just in humour, but in everyday life, in particular in squeals, because currently Scots Doric is often used socially, but nay professionally. For example, if you go up to the Broch or Peter Heed, you'll find, for example, Sparkies from Poland and Lithuania, who have squeal English but fi find themselves learning a Doric. In their work life, it is fit folk spick. In plenty walks of life, Doric is useful and used. We need to see mere work gone in to embed the language into the curriculum and into social life, and I spear at the Cabinet Secretary for a commitment on this as the legislation is taken forward. 
Presiding officer, I want to reflect on a recent poem I've seen on, on a Facebook written by Brian Thompson, a, a man who originally fared the North East. And he wrote, A Doric was used by your folks at home. It was not used in squeal. If you answered a teacher in Doric tongue, it did not ging doon weel. When you got home, it was Doric again until the squeal next day. S sitting thinking all the words you can you've need to say. When my bairns were growing up, the Doric was left a hen. I did not pass on all the words. It really was a sin. But now at last I understand the words I hate to save. The Doric words are precious. Do not tuck them to your grave. So Billy, start your screaming. We want it all passed on. It's in our bleed, it's history. We do not want it gone. And mine and tell your loons and quines to keep the words alive. We are man do our very best to help it to survive. Brian is absolutely right and he fits a, a, a book that he writes and it really resonates with me. I was told me to use a Doric and squeal and it does hate an impact. Young bairns heading at the squeal for the first time are excited and the first thing they're told is that they're speaking wrong. And quite frankly, presiding officer, that's just cruel and we need to stop it. We need to embrace, embrace their Scots and let them learn the English at their own pace. So in closing, presiding officer, I want this bill to genuinely be used to normalise, support and protect Scots and Doric. And I look forward to being involved as the work is taken forward. Thank you, Ms. Barr. I now call Rhoda Grant, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by Jim Fairley. Ms. Grant. Thank you. I want to focus my remarks mainly on Gaelic. And to start with, I want to say I'm slightly concerned about having a language bill that tries to cover both Gaelic and Scots in one piece of legislation. While there's a huge amount to do in Gaelic, Scots lags even further behind with regard to official recognition. I would prefer the Scottish Government would try to look to Wales and the Welsh language as a guide as to how to proceed with Gaelic rather than to measure it against the progress of Scots, which we've heard about. And that's not about putting a greater value on either language, just to recognise that they have, a very diff have very different needs um, and ways in which they will need to protect and promote them. I know there will be many people who criticise and ask why are we speaking about languages that have fewer and fewer speakers today. Um, they might all... Ms Grant, could you please stop just for a wee second? I have a request to you, Ms Grant, uh, for an intervention from Emma Harper. Are you willing to take that intervention, Ms Grant? Yes, I'll take that intervention. Okay. Thank you. I call Emma Harper. Thanks, President Officer, and thanks, Rhoda Grant, for, uh, for hearing us. My understanding is that the consultation is looking at both Scots and Gaelic, but it's not necessarily going to be one revised bill. Um, understanding that it's, it's what we we'll have to do, we're not even going to measure Gaelic and Scots, because you can't measure them both at the same time. So I just want to clarify what she's uh, trying to present. Ms Grant? Well, if, if Emma Harper knows something more than I do about how this is going to proceed, then I'm glad to have um, that, that reassurance that both will be looked at separately, depending on their needs. Presiding officer, I know that there will be many people who criticise and ask why we're speaking about languages. And they might also say, why are we talking about this during a cost of living crisis? Is it not better to spend money elsewhere? And I want to address that head on. Firstly, our language holds our history and culture. The rich have museums and art galleries stuffed full of their history and culture recorded at great length for com the common people. Our history is held in songs, poems and stories handed down in the generations, held in the language they were spoken. And Gaelic was spoken throughout most of Scotland and indeed into England. It has died back to the West Highlands and Islands and sadly the history of the lowlands that was held in Gaelic has already been lost. So let's avoid that happening to the West Highlands and Islands. In these areas and indeed other areas of Scotland, many people depend on language for their livelihood, be it teaching, broadcasting or promotion. Without Gaelic, there would not be a media industry in our islands. 
and yet many of our English medium broadcasters started their careers in Gaelic broadcasting, and that goes for many of the support staff as well. Careers that would be unknown in these parts were it not for Gaelic. In these areas, good careers and well-paid jobs can be hard to find, therefore Gaelic finds itself as an economic bastion against depopulation of young people. Therefore, the promotion of Gaelic is part of the solution in tackling the cost of living crisis and not a choice to be measured against it. There are also arguments and debates around how we protect and promote Gaelic, and that's healthy. We cannot leave the protection and promotion of Gaelic solely to Borden Gaelic. Everyone has a role to play. And it's also right that the work of the board is scrutinised. The UHI publication, Gallic, The Gaelic Crisis in the Vernacular Community, caused a stir, but highlighted the need to protect Gaelic-speaking communities in order to protect the language. An issue that is raised with me time and time again is the need for jobs and homes in the Gaelic heartlands in order to keep our young people there and to keep Gaelic-speaking communities together because too often our homes go to the highest bidder, people from parts of the country and indeed the world that are more affluent than our local population and people who do not speak Gaelic or feel the need to learn. And that needs to change. We need to make sure that we have local, a local housing market to allow local people to stay. And we also need to provide them with meaningful careers. When we welcome people into our communities, we must also encourage them to learn the language and to play their part in keeping it alive. And I know many do this, and native speakers also need to encourage them. It's a strange sensation to hear someone speak in Gaelic and believe that they're local, only to discover their accent is very different in, in English, revealing a very different heritage. While protecting the vernacular community and promoting Gaelic speaking there, we need to create more new Gaelic speakers as well. We need education to strengthen a children, child's rights to learn Gaelic. We need to ensure the Gaelic medium starts preschool and follows on throughout the whole of the education system. And last week, Jim Hunter co called for Saul Morostig to have university status in its own right. UHI is, of course, a university in Salt Morostic forms part of that and provides Gaelic degree courses. But I think what Jim Hunter was looking for is a university that allows students to study other academic courses through the medium of Gaelic. And this is, of course, necessary for students who have spent their whole lives learning through that medium. It's, of course, not easy. We have a shortage of Gaelic teachers, and it is also a struggle to provide for teaching of Gaelic as a language in English medium schools. We should have Gaelic as a compulsory subject for every child in Scotland if we want to keep up with Wales and their promotion of Welsh. To do that, we need to increase Gaelic speakers and thereby teachers. Our ambition shouldn't be limited by the imagination of government. We need to protect and grow the number of Gaelic speakers. We need to take this action. And that action might not be universally popular, but it is about choices. We're at a crossroads. Continuing as we are will lead to the future decline of our languages. We must take positive action to promote both Gaelic and Scots if we are not going to lose them altogether. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms Grant. I now call Jim Fairley to be followed by Michael Cap Stewart. Mr Fairley. Uh, many thanks, President Officer. And I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for Education for bringing this motion forward today. I had the great ple pleasure recently to visit Goodleburn Primary School in my constituency, where I was able to see firsthand Gaelic medium education and work. Um, the head teacher Anne Marie Sands and the early years teacher Christine McGregor had an enthusiasm that I have to say was utterly infectious for what they were doing. And I, I'd like to say I was just a wee bit envious of the opportunity that GME is given to these kids, but also immensely proud of the fact that the Scottish Government are pursuing it. Because there's a richness to the language of both Scots and Gaelic that I think we'd be all the worse off for not having. For the majority of us, as has been demonstrated today, Gaelic is probably a step too far. I once tried to teach myself the language with a wee black book of Gaelic words and phrases. It was utterly impossible because the language is a living, breathing thing that can't be learned rote. For me, what I see in the Gaels is that they live in the language. Now, the GMA programme gives the children, the young people, 
the chance to live in that language as it should be used. And that bilinguality, a bilingual uh, skill of being proficient in Gaelic and English is, will be life changing. Absolutely, yeah. Alistair Allen. Please do. But I can assure the member it is possible to learn Gaelic by rote. I have done it. <laughs> Jim Fairley. <laughs> I stand corrected and absolutely in your shadow. Um, starting at primary one, the classes follow the exact same curriculum as the English language and education, but most lessons are taught in Gaelic. So as the children are learning any particular subject, be it maths or history, they are also picking up another language. And from primary three onwards, English is introduced so that pupils are bilingual by the time they reach primary seven. There's a wee bit of an issue here in that we need to consider whether primary one is in fact young enough to be starting. And I know that Goodleburn are in fact trying to introduce uh, an early years education as well. And it's well known there are many developmental benefits to the kids learning Gaelic. Beyond learning to speak in a different code, Research shows that children who understand more than, one language, more than one language are able to think more flexibly and creatively and also tend to demonstrate more focus at multitasking. Clearly something I haven't learned. Furthermore, in future life, being bilingual offers many career opportunities, while studies show that it may also keep the brain sharper for longer and later years. There's a great policy and one that I wish was more readily accessible. In fact, it was even available when I was a laddie. And I sincerely hope that it will be clear pathways for the, the children at Goodleyburn to continue their education in Gaelic into the next stage of their life as they move on to secondary school. And I hope that the Scottish Government's commitment to support and grow Gaelic education will deliver tangible results such as wider availability for more kids in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there may be value in looking at the COVID solution to teaching Gaelic at, uh, at Goodleyburn Primary. Um, when they go to secondary school by uh, things such as egg oil or strolling and the cabinet secretary might want to address how we're going to uh, develop it in, in secondary. It's hugely encouraging to see the youngsters, youngsters with a keen interest to speak Gaelic, a language that is thriving in Scottish social attitudes survey revealing that the number of Scots who speak some Gaelic has doubled in the past decade. Whilst globally upwards of 449,000 people have used Duolingo, but well done to Emma Harper for starting the campaign to also include Scots. The members will recall the real belter of a speech given by Billy Kay in Time for Reflection back in April in this, of this year. He highlighted how important it is to the future generations that the tongue they speak is not out of place in Scotland where they live. The language that we do most of our business here in the Parliament is English, which is socially, politically and economically dominant in our culture and society. But we should never lose sight of the fact of how important the native languages here in Scotland are to our land and our people. There are a million and a half people who speak Scots, and as Billy Kay said, from Maidenkirk to Johnny Groats and Anant. To those people, it represents an important symbol of their identity, their history and their culture, and our intangible heritage. Last month, when I was climbing Kilimanjaro, the Royal Maud took place in Perth, which Murdo Fraser talked about earlier on, and I'm glad to say that it was a, a report as a huge success. And I'm proud that our Parliament recognised that Scotland is a nation of different folk, different cultures and different languages, and it's important that we protect and enhance the richness of our linguistic diversity. Languages such as Gaelic and Scots contribute to the ecological balance <coughs> of our societies and the way biodiversity does in nature. We must protect this diversity by supporting the government's aims to turn up the volume for our Gaelic and Scots speaking communities. And in this chamber where we represent the folk, to quote Billy Kay again, more important than none, you'll be gone you'll be gaining a signal to the wains and scale that the culture of their home is valued by folk ele elected by their mothers and fathers. That's no slang, as we were ends tell. That's the language of our own kith and kin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fairley. I now call Co-Cab Stewart to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Uh, Ms Stewart. Ta. Ta believe. Thank you. Shukriya, presiding officer. I'm delighted to take part in this debate, with my first language being Punjabi, learned English, tuned into Scots, fully appreciative of Gaelic. Dating back centuries, Gaelic is one of the oldest indigenous languages in Europe. Over 1,000 years older than English, Gaelic is an integral part of Scotland's makeup, and it has been said that what is true for bones is also true for the human language. The essential elements are just one piece of a much wider, ever-evolving picture. Gaelic is more than words uh, which comprise it. It is an emotional connection to Scotland's cultural heritage. 
So I welcome this discussion today and will celebrate its revival and reconsider the key to its preservation. While Gaelic can appear a wee bit intimidating to those who are not uh, speaking it, Scots may feel more familiar. Now also recognised as a regional language under the European Charter for regional or minority languages, Scots is much closer in style to English, but varies considerably even across relatively small geographical areas. As University of Glasgow sociolinguistics professor Jennifer Smith said, lots of people say, oh, I don't speak Scots, but just because you don't sound like Robert Burns doesn't mean to say that you're not speaking Scots. Professor Smith headed the university's Glasgow Scots Syntax Atlas, an incredible online resource uh, research tool launched in 2019, which maps out the use of Scots across Scotland. From the gone in Oz in Glasgow to the fit like in Northeast, the Atlas confirmed that you don't have to travel very far to appreciate the rich differences we should be proud of our vibrant local lexicon and indigenous tongue, as well as the host of other languages found here, including my own Punjabi and Urdu. There are over 170 languages spoken in Scotland, including Makaton, French, Cantonese, German, Bengali, Spanish, the list goes on. Embracing the nuances of your own history and heritage allows for a deeper respect and understanding of other cultures. And I have been pleased to see a resurgence that mirrors the Gallic Renaissance elsewhere, uh, such as within the Sami communities of Europe's far north and through the Indigenous Languages Act in Canada. Here in Scotland, the revival of Scots and Gaelic has been aided in recent years by a variety of wondrous efforts. Within my own constituency of Glasgow Kelvin, Partick Thistle Football Club, in collaboration with Glasgow City Council Gaelic Education Services and Bordna Gaelic, became the first Scottish professional football club to have bilingual English and Gaelic signage at the stadium in a bid to increase the visibility of the language. And I would cheekily encourage them to also add Scots to their signage in due course. This is one of a number of exciting projects, activities in the pipeline, which seeks to encourage engagement with Gaelic medium education schools. This brings us to another gem within my constituency, the Glasgow Gaelic School. Opened in 1999, it is one of four nurseries, three primaries and one secondary within the city currently providing Gaelic medium education. Whilst teaching Gaelic was sadly never part of my repertoire, I did find that children really connected with the Scots language, although I did have to emphasise that it was not slang. I remember a couple of wee laddies in particular who had struggled immensely with reading and writing. Average texts in English were of no interest to them. They liked cars. I discovered the Scots poem, The Wee Rid Motor by Sandy Thomas Ross, which captured their imagination because the words sounded like how they talked. Their imagination was engaged. They were able to read out loud to an audience of parents who listened intently as they read presiding officer having not been able to read before. In my wee red motor, I can gang for miles up and down the garden, through the lobby whiles. Money a big motor, gangs te tun afar. None can gang where I gang in my wee red car. <laughs> Blithe memories indeed, and children reading inspired by Scots. The Scottish Government has also recognised the many benefits of Gaelic and Scots within our schools, and I am pleased to see a new national strategic approach to Gaelic medium education is one of the areas currently under cons consultation. These languages should indeed be normalised within our institutions and across all of our communities. The proposed Scottish Languages Bill has the opportunity to contribute towards this significantly. 
I would like to echo the recommendation of Bordner Gaelic that the education strategy should include a workforce recruitment and development priority and that any new education agencies created should have Gaelic education responsibilities embedded within them. In closing, Presiding Officer, research has demonstrated that bilingual children enjoy improved cognitive development and the earlier the second language is introduced, the better. In a way that most adults cannot, children absorb sounds, patterns and structures and are unencumbered by years of lessons that drill us into us just one singular way of communicating. Languages equip us with so much, it is vital that we protect them. Papilat. Thank you. Shukriya. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Stewart. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Emma Roddick for a generous six minutes, uh, Ms Burgess. Thank you. Pre Presiding officer, I welcome this debate on the future of Gaelic and Scots and the intention to draw attention to the consultation on the Scottish Languages Bill. It is vital that everyone in Scotland plays their part. Gaelic and Scots are crucial to our culture, our society, our relationship with our environment and our future. I will play my role as MSP for the Highlands and Islands, of course, uh, and encourage engagement. But, presiding officer, consultations can be challenging to engage with, so I would ask the Cabinet Secretary what support is in place to make engagement more accessible. It is only with the pers persistence of many people engaging over decades, each one bringing their kindling, that we have the level of support for Gaelic today, and I trust that with this upcoming bill, we will see support for Scots. Action is required the before the flames of both language languages flicker out, Gaelic more so. This bill is our opportunity to stoke the fire, to add the much needed wood to ensure that we have great bonny fires blazing long into the future. We must take leadership to remove the mantle of shame foisted upon speakers of both languages over generations. Shame creates inertia and reluctance. There should be no shame in speaking any of our languages, and there should be no inertia on the part of any organization tasked with supporting their growth or development. I am grateful to my colleagues in this chamber, including the Cabinet Secretary, demonstrating leadership in speaking Gaelic and Scots, and not just today, but at other times. I will centre the rest of my contribution on Gaelic, not because Scots is any less important. I've been studying Gaelic for a while, including Cursa Integri, and I've reached a thousand-day streak on Scottish Duolingo, whereas I've only had time to take a much-loved three-week three Scots course as part of an academic research project. So bring on that Scots language Duolingo. We can learn from what has happened to, the Gaelic, to Gaelic since the 2005 Gaelic Language Act and in turn ensure swifter and more robust support for Scots in this legislation. Presiding officer, the stark reality is that today most Scottish pupils leave school without ever having studied Gaelic. There's a focus, quite rightly, on Gaelic medium education, GME, but we should also make provision for Gaelic learner education at primary and high school levels. Making this provision could spark greater interest and enthusiasm and make it possible for pupils to access Gaelic without having to attend a fully immersive school. Turning to GME, the consultation includes a proposal for a new strategic approach. It's good to see that the government recognizes that there is a need. Since the 2005 Act, progress in GME development has been limited and slow. While the number of pupils in primary GME has risen by 80%, that is actually only 1% of the national total of primary school pupils. Improvement in secondary level has been slower, where only 0.5% of the total secondary school pupils are in GME. The long-promised high school in Scotland's capital could go a long way to underscoring Gaelic's importance. I recognize the challenges for secondary level where there is the need for teachers who teach a, specia a speciality subject in Gaelic, but if we are to recruit well, 
and for the long term, we need plans to provide support and a clear career path. The Gaelic Act requires all public bodies, including local authorities, to develop Gaelic language plans. The good news is that 30 of the 32 local authorities have plans. Argyll and Butte, North Ayrshire, Midlothian, Aberdeen City, Inverclyde, Scottish Borders, and so it goes on. But of these 30 councils, 13 make no provision for Gaelic in any of their schools. A further three now provide GME, but this only came about through persistent campaigning by parents. Parents shouldn't have to battle for a language that should be provided. That's why I'd like to see an enforceable parental right to Gaelic medium, preschool and primary school education established. In areas where Gaelic is widely spoken, Gaelic language plans must ensure that the language is taken into account in relation to provision in fields such as housing, employment and transport. There is a proposal to review Board na Gaelic, the statutory language board. It would be good to hear from stakeholders on the board's ability to carry out its responsibilities. Does it have the right powers? Is it funded adequately? We can look to Wales, where the Welsh Government provides leadership for their ambitions by requiring local authorities to heed numerical targets and develop Welsh education strategic plans. Most concerning in the uh, proposals for the bill is the Scottish Government's inclusion of the Gaeltach, which stakeholders say seem to have come out of nowhere. Where would we draw the line? Topa Namara, Motherwell, Kiliviarnik, Kilmarnik, Dunajin. And there is concern that drawing boundaries would undermine and demoralize those in weaker areas who are working hard to maintain the language. Presiding officer, with much more that could be said, I close by saying that I will play my part to encourage engagement in the development of this bill and the future of Gaelic and Scots. Thank you very much, Ms. Burgess. And I call Emma Roddick to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Again, a generous uh, six minutes, uh, Ms. Roddick. Top alive, Officer really. Thank you, presiding officer. Scots, two languages which I enjoy constantly learning about and linking to my experience of growing up in this country which is so rich in culture. I think too often we talk about the past of these languages and many still think they are in the past, but there is a future for them and I encourage as many people as possible to engage in this conversation and discuss what that future should look like. I do have to say that I am worried about the policy to create a Gaeltach, not just because to me it already exists, I've grown up believing that I live in it, I would like to know more detail about whether this could mean giving up on Gaelic in other places. Bordna Gaelic sent round a very helpful briefing on Friday outlining the findings in the Scottish Social Attitude Survey, which showed that those who come into contact with Gaelic are more likely to hold positive views about the language. And that doesn't surprise me. Have bacon Gaelic, Ackham, and the more that I have a little Gaelic, how much Highland Scots I know is influenced by it. Even words like smashing, which sounds best in Highland accents, I think, are thought by some controversially to originate in Gaelic, smashing. But like most, I didn't realise I had been experiencing Gaelic out with watching BBC Alipa coverage of Scotland's women's and championship football and quickly learning what Booya and Jerich meant. Yellow and red. Engaged with phage activities when I was wee, the Gaelic side of it seemed somehow out of reach and therefore folk who already knew how to speak it, which I'm going to try to do now if folk want to use. <clears throat> it is not often that we have opportunities or hear about Gaelic when you are of an age where your parents in particular want you to learn it and sending you to FM chief or classes in French. My mother told me to take French instead of Gaelic and I remember the difficulties my friends had who were in Gaelic classes in having a teacher and classes and at normal times and immersing themselves in the, a language in, in the little cupboard where they were taught. That's as long as they can, as, although I can order coffee and lunch in French on, on holiday, it is much more difficult to get the same kind of 
attention in Gaelic. It's easier the more that we put into it. For example, I now love to look out the window on train journeys and learn about the origins of Gaelic place names or Google why Dingwall Norse isn't Inverpeffer or alternatively doesn't have a parliament in it. I do also want to directly address the mention of my region in the consultation. I accept that the consultation is probably not referring to it in whole, but this is not clear. The Highlands and Islands is referred to repeatedly as the area where Gaelic would once have been the predominant language. And while there are some communities in the Highlands who would take issue with this, putting that to one side, I think the natural inclusion by readers of Orkney and Shetland is uh, the biggest problem. These are places where not only was Gaelic never the predominant language, but it would be extremely rare for someone to have any. The predominant language in the Isles was Norn and is now a dialect of Scots and English. It's important, I think, that in recognising the cultural her heritage of some areas, we do not forget or damage others. I would rec... Yes, sure. Yeah. Alistair Allen. I, I, I thank the member for giving way, and, and I, I really agree with the point that she's making about the diversity uh, of language that there exists around Scotland. I mean, might it be said that our well, motivation for having an official Gaelic is simply to include that we don't work on a lowest common denominator basis? And Dr Allen, could you perhaps address your remarks through the microphone? I beg your pardon. You. Uh, may, might a case be made for, uh, as I think it could, for a, an official Gaeltacht po policy uh, based around the idea of ensuring that we don't have a kind of lowest denominator, common denominator approach to language policy and that the areas where there is a great tradition uh, enjoy particular support? Emma Roder. And this is, as I said, um, I, I would be keen to hear more detail about what is being proposed and I do hope that, that folk in the Highlands and Islands who are maybe thinking along the same lines as, as myself will engage with the, the consultation to, to shape it as, as we'd want it to be shaped. And I'd recommend to anyone interested in Shetland in particular that they check out Shetland Forwards who promote the language and words found in those islands. While there are words which will be familiar to most with any Scots, like Oxter, there is also a very much Shetland-specific vocabulary, many with um, Old Norse origins. My cousin was giving me and my sister a lift recently, and we enjoyed comparing the vocabularies of our Shetland and Rosher families. Uh, some words used in tellings off were, were in common, though that could be our granny's influence, whereas others were extremely specific. And I love finding out the geography of certain words and phrases. I still haven't figured out where along the East Coast seagulls start to, start to become Scotties. And I'll not say in the chamber what my mom's name for them was. Like many, I didn't know some of the words that I had heard growing up were Scots and usually can't until I came to Edinburgh and started using them. Not only did my uni pals frequently pester me to say chicken dippers, which was a favorite meal back then, they would often be very confused when I called my cat a wee bism accused one of them of being a clipe or called somebody Thrawn. Almost as confused as I was when I learned that you can't order a red pudding supper in the capital. I very much welcome the announcement that the Gallic Capital Fund will develop school units in Tain and Skye in my region. When I went to Bridge End Nursery, I remember the teachers being very strict with me on some of my words. I spent the first three years of my life in Cardras and I might have picked up some Ouija-isms when I was wee. I'm quite happy to now have a Highland accent, though my sister thinks it's more Inverness now than the Rosher one she has. But I do think it's a shame that many schools will still tell Burns off for speaking in their native language. In my region, many places are still hurting from the historic oppression of Gaelic and our culture in general, which perhaps makes me a bit sensitive to these things. But if we want both these Scottish languages to survive, we cannot be teaching kids that it is bad or wrong to speak them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Roddick. And I call Jamie Hawker Johnson to be followed by Claire Adamson for, again, a generous six minutes. Mr. Hawker Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. As an Orcadian, I won't be speaking in the Gaelic or uh, Scots today, but I do welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on Scotland's minority languages. Scotland, of course, has a long and diverse linguistic heritage, and representing the Highlands and Islands, our region remains most obviously the home of the majority of native Gaelic speakers. But Northern Scotland also contains a number of different traditions representing our long and complicated history. Our previous language, Pictish, is still obscured in some mystery. Its relationship to other languages of these islands is hotly contested, but its legacy remains like many of our dead languages in names and places. Although Pictish might feel long lost, I mention it because the process of language death is perhaps not as distant as we might think. In the mid 19th century, the Norn tongue, once flourishing, died. A Norse language it had endured in Orkney, Shetland and parts of the north of the mainland for centuries, long after the islands 
have been traded off to the Scottish Crown. At times, Gaelic has seemed similarly at risk, but there's always been a significant work to keep it going, to preserve it as a cultural marker of my region. It's this case, though, that modern times have brought a convergence in language varieties in the UK. We speak more like each other than ever before. Geographical differences, while distinct and sometimes pronounced, have softened, whether that's in the north of Scotland or in the tip of Cornwall. Some of the cultural richness that languages preserve has undoubtedly been blunted. But increasingly, we are finding the tools to recognize and to embrace that heritage, to bring it to wider audiences. Last year, I had the pleasure of visiting Salma Rostig in Skye, part of the University of Highlands and Islands, as mentioned earlier. Only founded in the, late, in the late 70s, by the early 80s, this institution had captured the imagination of government and cultural institutions at all levels, who supported it to become a thriving, academic institution that it is today. My own attempts to learn a little Gaelic when I first started working as a young advisor here in Parliament and took some lessons have not endured quite so well. Beyond basic greetings, I am afraid my abilities fall far short, particularly of speaking in a debate like this. But on a visit to Salma Rostig in 2004, our new king remarked that Scottish life is greatly enriched by the Gaelic dimension. In Sky and across my region, that remains very much the case today. Indeed, it's impossible to imagine a Scotland without this dimension. It's part of our story. I previously enjoyed uh, visiting the Western Isles and hearing the local songs in Gaelic, preserving what is very much a living language and culture, one which exists alongside English and where the two survive strongly alongside one another. Both are enriched by this co coexistence. But it's not just Gaelic that is part of our cultural tradition in the Highlands and Islands. The various distinct and overlapping dialects and variants of Scots, for example, are also key markers of who we are in the North. As mentioned, my good friend and former parliamentary colleague, Peter Chapman, a proud Buchan man, is a great champion of the Doric in the Northeast, probably one of Scotland's most distinctive language varieties. Many a happy evening can be had past... I will, yes. Emma Harper. Um, thanks very much for... Um let me just intervene. You mentioned Peter Chapman. Peter Chapman wanted to join the Scots Lead Cross Party Group. We didn't have any Conservative members the new, so would the member maybe do some encouragement to see if any of his colleagues would want to join our Cross Party Group? Jamie Hawker Johnson. Well, I can certainly encourage my colleagues to join, um, if that's the way. I know, as I say, Peter was a great, has been a great um, uh, supporter and promoter of the Gaelic, and um, I've enjoyed, as I say, many, many many times with his uh, poems and songs in the Doric um, and his efforts to produce that. So perhaps uh, I will do my best to encourage others to get involved with that. In the Northern Isles, where I call home, Shetlandic is increasingly being recognized for its distinctiveness as a language or dialect, retaining and keeping alive some of the noticeable influences from Norn. Culture will change and adjust, but keeping alive some of those links with the past has value in itself, and not just as a curiosity, but as a reflection of what builds distinct, distinctiveness of places and of communities. This parliament has long been supportive of Scotland's minority languages, and so too has local government and the UK government, and they've been key in work to maintain them. Other organisations have played an important role as well. The National Lottery has, since its outset, provided important funding to language and cultural projects and organisations across my region. And institutions like Fashion and Gale, based in Portree but with a Scotland-wide reach, have kept the flame of Gaelic's cultural heritage alive and flourishing, particularly amongst young people. Last week, the UHI team running Just Unearthed were displaying in this parliament, showing the potential of new technology to educate and inform, bringing culture from the region to new audiences across the world. And as has been mentioned repeatedly, the Royal National Mod has endured since the 19th century, interrupted only by war or, most recently, pandemic. And while the BBC's role in providing Gaelic language services through radio and television is well known, the creation of BBC Alipa has brought many of these cultural, uh, cultural attributes of Gaelic heritage into homes across the country and beyond. Passion has been the motive force behind these ventures. Many people have given hours, sometimes lifetimes, in the preservation of the cultural tradition or other traditions of my region. And this goes beyond the work of the state or any strategy. But it's important that this work continues and we welcome further proposals to bring this about and to support both the institutions and the grassroots efforts that sustain languages, heritage and culture. 
We want to see a thriving linguistic culture, particularly in my own region, where Gaelic is such an everyday part of life and remains a first language in many communities, something that the Scottish Government has indicated it will clearly recognise. And among that will be greater focus on language skills, not just for Gaelic, but for other modern languages as well, and emphasising their importance in education. Presiding officer, there is a great deal of consensus around this chamber on the need to, pre to preserve and protect Scotland's minority languages. In this area, we have often managed to move forward in a constructive and cross-party way. But more importantly, government language policy must be based on wide consultation with speakers, communities and organisations. And it's in that spirit I hope we will move forward with any developments in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Harko Johnson. Um, I now call Claire Adamson, who is the final speaker in the open debate, after which we will move to closing um, speeches, at which point all those who have participated in the debate will be expected to be in the chamber. With that, Claire Adamson, again, a generous six minutes. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I'm a North Lanarkshire resident, and I was a councillor there from 20 th 2007 to 2011. And as such, I was very familiar with the Gaelic education medium schools in the area. The delivery model there has been so successful in nurturing Gaelic in my community, and I was glad to hear Mr Fairley mention it in his speech as well. I was also delighted to visit Eileen a few years ago and meet former head teacher in her community, Cathy Johnson. The strength of Gaelic language there is evident in song and poetry, as well as at the supermarket when I, I was maybe buying a little uh, brooklady. Presiding officer, it is a love of the sangs and the poems that I would like to focus on today. I want to commend all of my colleagues speaking in Gaelic, Scots and Doric today. I don't have their flair or their experience. I was a wee lass in Lanarkshire and Liz Lockhead's Scots and English poem Bairns Sang speaks to my experience. It was January, a gay drich day, the first day I went to the school. So my mum hat me up in my good navy blue nap coat with a red tartan hood, barreled a scarf around my neck and put on my pixie and my pokies. It was that bitter. She said, no, you'll no starve. She gave me a wee kiss and a kid on scalp on the bum and sent me across the playground to the place I'd learned to say. It was January and a really dismal day, the first day I went to school. I listened to the comments about prescription and teaching Scots language, but Liz Lockhead is from Lanarkshire. She went to Newt Hill Primary in my uh, colleague Stephanie's constituency and went to DL High School in Motherwell. And I think it would be a real shame if the young people there weren't able to enjoy her poems or indeed her incredible translation of Euripides Medea that was such a success at the Edinburgh Festival just this year. But my experience was the experience of so many of us, and mother tongue was not correct, appropriate, valued, or tolerated. I hope that we have moved on from telling Wayne's the rang at every turn. Especially with the wealth of literature and songs at their fingertips today. And fingertip aptly reminds me of my own primary rendition of the Sayre Finger. A few years ago, I was delighted to attend the Scots Language Awards and see literature such as Nip Nebs, written by Susie Briggs and illustrated by Ruthie Redden, telling the story of Jack Frost in Scots celebrated. And wonderful translations. And for doubters, translation means the process of expressing the sense of words or text in another language. Matthew Fitt translated children's classics such as Roald Dahl's Twits into the Egypts. And his works with Scots, James, uh, Scots writer James Robertson have been uh, celebrated for their depth and their um, knowledge of Scots. But it was Billy Kay's book, The Mother Tongue, that was a game changer for me. It stripped away that Scottish cringe and the notion that the words that resonated with me, they were acceptable, they were appropriate, and they were evocative in a way that truly speaks to my soul, especially in poetry and songs. At the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, the world was enthralled at the beautiful rendition of Hamish Henderson's Freedom Come All Ye by Pozema Machitska. Over one billion people saw that performance. A contemporary song written in Scots, it describes the wind of change blowing through Scotland and the world, sweeping away exploitation and imperialism. 
It extols Scottish values, but it's when you hear the Scots, I swear you feel that wind. Rock the wind in a clear day's dawning, blows the clouds, heels their gaudy o'er the bay, but there's ne'er no a rock wind blowing through the great glen of the world today. Presiding officer, Scots is recognised as meeting the European Charter of, for Regional and Minority Languages. And language is remembered as a human right. Language is mentioned in many of the articles of human rights, in justice, education and children's rights. It is the culture that defines people. It is inherent to identity and it shouldn't be rolled out once a year for Burns Night. Though Burns is indisputably a phenomenon. We've talked about the economy and tourism and how we can support our languages but Robert Burns and the Scottish Economy is a groundbreaking study that was led by Murray Pittock for the University of Glasgow. And indeed, I should mention my colleague, Joan McCalmine, for her exemplary work in this area. An estimated 9.5 million people attend Burns suppers every year. And it puts overall, the report puts the overall annual value of Burns to the Scottish Economy at £203 million, with a further £139 million contributed to the value of Scotland itself, the brand. Our tourism includes new visitor facilities, burn-related festivals and branded products. And cultural tourism in particular is highly beneficial to the economy. Robert Burns' birthplace museum in Alloway is second only to Shakespeare's birthplace in visitor numbers in the UK. A Scots language bill will underpin this language and its potential in Scotland. William McIlvanny opined the, that Scotland is a mongrel nation. Our Scots language reflects that, with influences as mentioned by my colleagues from all over our history, our battles, invasions, our tribes, words from Latin, Danish, French, Welsh, to name but a few, including Norse, as mentioned by my colleague. But the language of our mongrel nation does not mean it's doggerel, as Burns was once churlishly described by Jeremy Paxman. By way of evidence, I will finish with a bird's quote in education. A set of dull, conceited hashes confuse their bairns in college classes. They gang eye sticks and come out asses. Gee me eye spark on nature's fire. That's other learning I desire. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Adamson. We move to the closing speeches. I know there's a couple of, co no, there's a couple of colleagues um, who were participating in the debate who are not in the chamber at the moment, which is very disappointing. I will at least expect some explanation for that. With that, I call Martin Whitfield to close for around seven minutes, uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I will open slowly to allow those to return to the chamber. Um, not a usual tactic of mine, but I think it is right to say that if we look at the quality of the debate and the agreement that has existed across this chamber about the importance of the subject matter, it is worth giving those who are slightly late the chance to come back, if only to hear good words said about them. But I would start by suggesting to the Scottish Government that there is an opportunity here, an opportunity that doesn't come along very often, where across this chamber, with the bravery to reach out, the bravery to listen, and the bravery to discuss, we could come towards the end of this session with a superb bill that supports the importance of language. And I think contributions from across this chamber have spoken not just about the purity of language, but actually what that empowers the people of Scotland. And in particular, many people have spoken about how that empowers our young people so that they don't go to school and feel that the language that they are speaking marks them out as being different from them teachers. Um, or as uh, Michael Mara so helpfully pointed out, um, my Geordie background, I must say, gives me a far greater access to Scots than um, perhaps I'd ever believed possible, and a real grateful one to that. Scottish Labour recognised the importance of Gaelic and Scots to our communities in Scotland and welcomed the Scottish Government's consultation on their commitments in this area. A simple statement that is made, but measures a great depth to the challenges that face Scotland with regard to Gaelic and Scots. Because it is a gateway problem to some of the challenges that our communities face. 
communities that historically were isolated because of geography that allowed the growth of fine languages that speak volumes when storytelling, when singing, when poetry that we've heard from across this chamber is used, because that was the strength of the community. The ability to tie its own history with events that may indeed have been tragic, may indeed have been positive, but they did so in their own language, and the languages developed to allow their experiences to be passed on. But as our communities came closer together, and through, we look now in the, mo the more modern age with the internet, and hence my question about technology, because we are the people who need to allow these languages to continue to develop through modern technology. The requirement of the dot Scott, simply with regard to emails, has made such a difference. There are challenges ahead with regard to technology, and we've heard some of them. More than pleasure to. Emma Harper. <clears throat> Can't even get my sentence out, uh, President Officer. You talk about technology. I know that one of the things that's happening in Defries and Galloway is when they're recruiting new nurses that are using Scots so that when they look after patients, when somebody says they've got a sear heed, it's something that even nurses from other countries can understand. Would you welcome that? Martin Whitfield. I may be challenged to keep to the relatively short time that you've granted me, Deputy Presiding Officer, because again, what we are talking about is the importance of language in some situations that can be incredibly stressful, where someone is speaking to you and you understand them. Not hidden behind professional phrases, not hidden, beh hidden behind words that, are <laughs> words that are described to set aside a profession from others, but to speak to people so that they understand. And that is a treasure that we should really f um, formulate in our young people, the way they speak in the playground. <laughs> And when they go in, is the way that they can speak to their teacher, is the way that they can answer the challenging questions. Be those questions indeed in another language, a modern language from France, Germany, Spain, or others, but to do so comfortable in the way that they know they're being communicated and they can be communicated to, so that when they have a challenge, they can reach out in the best way they feel safe to go, can you help? And the teacher, the parent, the stranger, the police officer, the nurse, the doctor, all of the ranked professionals that we put there can stand there and say yes and give the confidence for them to express that. I do want to make short mention of um, the uh, Gallic Immersion High School um, in Edinburgh and ask the Cabinet Secretary what the current situation is because I am aware of, of, of parents um, who I think phrase the need so brilliant, the need to create a linguistic bubble where pupils and staff would speak Gaelic throughout the day, which they say is the best way of learning a language. And that is so very true. So I'd be um, most grateful if in, in summing up, we can have a current situation with regard to the events here in Edinburgh. And very quickly, and with time slightly against me, let me turn to some of the fine contributions um, that we have today. And I apologize to the front benches um, as I'm going to skip them, because there was such a depth of um, submissions that we heard today. Theirs can be read by others later. Um, I'll turn to, to Willie Rennie because of his comments on focusing on areas where languages are naturally spoken. And there is a tension um, through the consultation about how the funds and resources are going to be put. And it would be interesting to hear um, the Cabinet Secretary's thoughts and views on that. Emma Harper um, mentioned something which I think is <laughs> maybe a myth, maybe that's too strong a word. She talked about Scots not just being a collection of dialects, and I think that's hugely important to understand. And she also powerfully mentioned that it is, of course, in Scots that the foundations of this parliament are held up. And it is a question I often hear that Scots is not a language, it's just a dialect. Now, I'm happy to acquiesce much to the concern should I next visit my birthplace, that Geordie is a dialect, it is not a language. But Scots is a language. It holds the treasured items of the ability to develop. And yes, that language is different geographically where you are, but all languages are different geographically. That is one of their strengths. And that is one of the great keys they hold to understanding a culture that sits behind those languages. It was Murdo Fraser who, of course, commented about the importance of storytelling in language. And it is in that past, in that storytelling, 
but in the future of storytelling that we need to look to Gaelic, we need to look to Scots, we need to look to Doric, and we possibly need to look to English as well, I must say. Yes? Claire Adamson. Thank you. i PD intervention, presiding officer. Um, I was just going to say, I did mention Hamish Henderson in, in my, um, my speech, and does he agree that he was talking about technology, that the fact that we have archives of spoken words and storytelling and, and the voices of the people is so important to how we can work towards um, securing the future of both these languages? Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful. And you're absolutely right. To preserve the spoken language in the way it is spoken is so important. Um, what I would say is I fear it, it's not a particularly new thing um, in that my um, father had reel-to-reel -reel tapes of dialects and languages from across the United Kingdom and bored me senseless about Northumbrian, um, a dialect that I, I truly love. But I think what is important now is that the access to those recordings is so much easier than it was in the past. And it allows people who are inquisitive about the name place that they come from, inquisitive about someone's surname, or actually sometimes in the case of young people, trying to just find something that's funny, but it allows them to listen. And it was interesting, the comment um, about humor being damaging, or there is a risk of humor being damaging to a language where it's looked on and almost mocked, I use that word carefully, um, by others. But what I would say is, Often, the communities that speak Gaelic, Doric, Scots, the communities that are closest together, are sometimes the communities that share the greatest humor about their own predicament because it allows them to get over some of the challenges that outside those communities thrust um, upon them. It was interesting to hear Jackie Dunpar emphasize the importance of the parity of esteem, and I think that's really important. There are many languages spoken across Scotland, and that is much to Scotland's credit, but there needs to be a parity. Calcub Stewart talks about the 170 languages that she's aware of that's spoken across Scotland. Each has the right to a parity of understanding, because that is the respect that a listener shows to someone who is speaking. And it is through that respect we really should continue to build the character of Scotland. I am conscious of time, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I do want to mention Rhoda Grant's contribution, which I think was very powerful and did raise a challenging question about how is this bill going to address two very separate languages? And I must say the very separate needs of preserving, enriching, and allowing those languages to go forward, because it is in those communities where the answers lie and the answers may be different depending on which communities we look at. I would also add, it was a great pleasure to see an intervention occurring from someone within this chamber to someone remotely, and it to be handled um, so well. I am now desperately conscious of time, and I, I, I will not um, push any further. Could I tempt you a little? Oh, excellent. Because to do, <laughs> to do so allows an opportunity um, to make mention of Alistair Allen's call and, and others who spoke in Gaelic, Doric, and in Scots, and that the translation service worked for once brilliantly, and will not allow members across this chamber to pester you to find out what it was that was said. But what a fascinating step forward that we can get to that. And I echo Alistair Allen's comments about a chamber in which multi-languages can be used, but backed up by all of that paperwork um, and support that needs to happen behind the scene. And my compliments to those today who provided, provided that. I will now start to draw my, conclusions, uh, my, my uh, contribution to the end and say, we are at a powerful moment where we can, um, as Partick Thistle have discovered, by putting dual signage up, reach out. And so across this chamber, we do have an opportunity. I think it would be and I just use the word shame, it would be a shame if this opportunity was missed during this session not to come out, both with a powerful statement about the languages of Scotland, which I think we all agree are very important, but more importantly, we look at how we can firstly preserve, I think we're getting there on that, empower, which I think our educationists have an obligation to do and are meeting that obligation, but most importantly, 
How do we allow our languages to expand so that the people across Scotland understand their link with history? As we were told, Gaelic, one of the oldest languages across Europe. We are at a crossroads and it would be a benefit if we went forward together and achieved the most. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for your patience. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Whitfield. I am uh, obliged. I, I am, though, um, more than disappointed that one of the members who participated in the debate still does not appear to have been uh, returned to the chamber. Um, with that, I call Stephen Kerr for around about eight minutes. Uh, Mr Kerr. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer and Martin Whitfield. Who, it is always a pleasure to follow Martin Whitfield when he speaks. And on this occasion, he had me grabbing for Google uh, to, to find out what exactly Partick Thistle had done. But I compliment Partick Thistle on their dual <laughs> signage, something that had escaped my attention. Um, like Donald Cameron said, as a Scottish Conservative, it will surprise no members of this Parliament that we are very interested in preserving, conserving and promoting Scotland's national culture, because our national culture is the very definition of who we are. It creates our belonging, and that's a very important part of what it means to be a Scot. We belong to this land, and we belong to each other. And from our natural landscape and all its beauty, to our magnificent shared history, to our cultural traditions, some of which have been referred to during this debate, and our locally produced legendary food and drink, we have a collective pride as Scots in everything that is Scottish. And that, Deputy Presiding Officer, extends to and includes our national languages and our local dialects. And uh, this has been a very full and wide-ranging debate. We've allocated a considerable amount of time to this subject, and quite rightly so. And the opening speech from the Cabinet Secretary, I thought, set the tone very well. She reminded us uh, of the economic benefits of, uh, of, of Gaelic in particular uh, and, 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 and also her encouragement that people uh, who speak Gaelic should feel free and confident to speak in that language without uh, uh, the, the negativity that she described and how important it is that our young people uh, are encouraged to speak, to learn and to speak Gaelic. And Donald Cameron gave his usual masterful speech about a subject that I know is very dear to his heart. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary, or the Minister, I don't know who's winding up, um, the Cabinet Secretary, will take to heart uh, the heartfelt plea that Donald Cameron made about the need for Gaelic uh, medium education workforce planning. He called in his speech for a task force to address these issues that have been mentioned by a number of speakers, and I felt that that emotional appeal in this debate requires an answer. Michael Mara, um, in his contribution, also talked about the shortage of uh, GME teachers, and that something needs to be done to address that. And Willie Rennie, highlighting the need for Gaelic speaking to be seen in the context of everyday use again, um, uh, he mentioned a crisis in social circles and underpinned the importance of getting the economic infrastructure and pillars right in order for those societies in the parts of Scotland where Gaelic should be the predominant language to thrive and to prosper. Um, Murdo Fraser introduced uh, characters from Sir Walter Scott. He, he was just about, in his usual eloquent way, to describe some passage or other about an encounter with the devil that he says stands out in his imagination as being an epoch of Scots literature, and up shot Alistair Allen. And I don't know whether an encounter with the devil uh, and Alistair Allen go together, because the good doctor always has something very useful to say, and he did today. <laughs> and I'm delighted to give way. <laughs> It's, it's, really more of an observation, it's really more of an observation, really, that in the Scots uh, uh, New Testament translated from the Greek by Lorimer, at least in the apocryphal bit at the end, the only character to speak in standard English is the devil. <laughs> Stephen Kerr. Well, 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 well I, can't, I cannot better that. That, 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 go, that goes to the heart of this debate, if I may say so. Um, and, he, and he reminds me, he reminds me, as, a, as an MSP for Central Scotland, from, from that state. I will come back to my quote in a minute. I'll give way to Fergus Ewing. Fergus Ewing. 
spirit of continuing the worthy cause of, of educating Mr. Kerr, presiding officer, could, could, I, <laughs> could, could I share with him a piece of information that I gleaned when one evening reading um, the fascinating and excellent uh, Jameson's Scotch Dictionary, where I came across a word that I thought may be of interest to Mr. Kerr, an old Scots word called bluffle heat. <laughs> bluffle heat. Yes, presiding officer, I can see your recognition. That, <laughs> Now, Bluffleheed, Bluffleheed uh, members will know, means uh, uh, a person, usually male, uh, with a very large head, but a very small brain. And I just wondered if that is a word that Mr. Kerr might want to, Mr. Ewing, without Mr. describing Ewing, the word Mr. to any Ewing, member of this Mr. chamber, Ewing, because that would be unparliamentary. Mr. Ewing, whether if I you could, could add resume that to your seat, Mr. Lexicon. Ewing. I think I would remind you, Mr Ewing, of the need to uh, retain respect while engaging in debate uh, within the chamber. And with that, I call Stephen Kerr. I accept the education on offer from Fergus Ewing in the spirit in which it was offered. And that will be a word that I will, that I will definitely now add to my vocabulary. But I was about to say, as a Central Scotland um, MSP, um, and reference to Lorimer's superb uh, translation of the New Testament into Scots, there is a wonderful phrase, those of you who are familiar with the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it has this, and I remember Falkirk, Falkirk is very much dear to my heart as a Central Scotland MSP. And the Scots, the Scots version of this verse from 1 Corinthians 13 is, in my bairn days, I had the speech of a bairn, the mind of a bairn, the thoughts of a bairn, but now I'm grown man muckle. I'm through with Athen Burnley, which I think is fantastic. It's a fantastic Scots translation. So I, I'm glad that you gave me uh, the opportunity uh, Dr. Allen to introduce that into this debate but he also mentioned in his speech um, Walter Scott and he also mentioned John Buchan these two great Scottish national patriots who were also unionists now there are many other contributions that I could mention but time does not permit me to mention them all but there was a lot of reference to our rich diverse national culture and that language is at the heart of it and Cocab Stewart says something, Deputy Presiding Officer, which I think is worthy of repetition, and that is how adept young children are from the very earliest of their years of understanding to pick up languages. I have uh, grandchildren who are learning, in addition to English, they're learning Russian, they're learning uh, Norwegian, they're learning French, and what they have the capacity to absorb uh, is, is phenomenal. And uh, I speak as an awestruck grandfather, but also as an awestruck monoglot, because unfortunately English is the only language that I can honestly say that I have a, a slight grasp of. Um, and then just let me continue with thanking Jamie Halco Johnson for mentioning the good work that the National Lottery has done in this particular field. And, and let me just say that having been born uh, in Dundee and raised in Forfar, um, I'm very well aware of the diversity of language and dialects. And, you know, one of, one of, one of the things that, that, that is true of growing up in a place like Forfar is you, you're caught between Dundee and Aberdeen, you're caught between Dundonian and Dorich, and you develop, there's a, there, there's a developing uniqueness about the language. And, and you know, this idea that, that, that these dialects don't exist within Scots can be challengeable. Because, for example, my wife, who comes from Ayr, uh, when she first met my father, who's born and lived all his days in, in, in Angus, when they first met, my wife said to me after their first meeting, what was he saying? She could, she could not fully understand everything he was saying. And that's part of the richness of our language culture and part of the heritage that we all enjoy. Dialect and language, by definition, is central to the identity of the towns, villages, and cities of Scotland. And dialect and language, Deputy Presiding Officer, is undoubtedly something that is recognizable. Loyalty, it, it locally, when we hear someone speaking in the dialect and language of our homes, then we instantly uh, feel that sense of belonging I referred to earlier. Now I welcome the new National Gaelic Language Plan Gaelic is a vitally important asset for Scotland, has been mentioned, and is representative of the richness, depth, and variation that we enjoy as Scots in our cultural 
and social life. Now, I'm not very sure, because of the way we do things in this parliament, how much time I have left, but I would suggest maybe I don't have very much time. How much time do I have left? I, I can give you another minute or so. A minute or so? Okay, that's great. So, let me just uh, conclude then, if I've only got a minute or so, um, by saying uh, that we go, we, we go for you know, two hours and 40 minutes and then you know, we don't have any time at the end. Um, children, children and young people in our classrooms who want to learn Gaelic should be able to learn the language. Um, and we should. We should utilise the technology. That's been, it's been alluded to a number of times. Why not create more virtual learning spaces? Why not create more virtual classrooms where pupils can be taught Gaelic or any other subject where there's a risk that we don't have enough of a teaching complement um, via Microsoft Teams or Zoom? And the teaching and promotion of Scotland's languages must, mustn't be just limited to Gaelic. That's been mentioned by a, uh, on a number of occasions. Um, and let me just conclude by saying that all, these, all this discussion of diversity and culture in the context of what it means to be a Scot and to enjoy this fantastic culture that we have as a nation, uh, this is the reason why I and my fellow Scottish Conservative colleagues believe that the teaching and promotion of Scots languages should be very much part of Scotland's language plan and that we should revel in that local diversity that has been on display uh, today. That diversity which brought together creates the richness of the country that we all love. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Kerr. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the debate for around about 10 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I say I think it has been a very uh, constructive and useful debate as we continue on the consultation um, that is ongoing on Gaelic and Scots at the moment. Uh, Donald Cameron uh, began, uh, as always, with, with a, a very informative um, and exceptionally useful speech um, at this stage in our journey. He, he particularly spoke about the use of Gaelic as a community language, uh, and I think that is a, an exceptionally important part uh, for us to take uh, be cognisant of as we move forward. And he also, of course, laid the challenge that legislation on its own cannot save a language. And he is absolutely quite correct um, in that um, it is not just for us here in the Scottish Parliament, uh, but also everyone that has an interest in languages to ensure that we can work together on that and legislation is but one small part in that. Uh, he and uh, many other uh, speakers uh, spoke about the importance of Gaelic medium education and particularly the Robertson um, Foxley uh, report that came out uh, recently. I think there is a, a, a number of um, important uh, challenges um, and proposals on how to take things forward um, in this uh, matter. And we do recognise, um, as is mentioned, of course, in the consultation, that the need for a strategic view on Gaelic medium education is exceptionally important important and uh, the recognition that we have as a government already as part of that is about increasing the number of Gaelic teachers in the system. Now there is already a number of, uh, there are already a number uh, of measures in place uh, to try and uh, support GME teachers and to increase them but we do keep that constantly under review uh, with new initiatives uh, being considered and developed. There are of course a range of options in place uh, for students and teachers to enter uh, GME teaching whether it's postgraduate, undergraduate options, uh, remote learning options and immersion routes but there is uh, more that uh, can be done. We know there is um, room for improvement. My officials are actually meeting with Bruce Robertson and Michael Foxley at the start of December um, and we will certainly make sure that we are looking at all the response, consultation responses that we get in um, on this matter to see what more uh, can be done on this issue because uh, as uh, Donald Cameron and others pointed out um, it is something we are very cognizant of and we know that this is very important for us to move forward um, with the protection and importantly the ability to grow the Gaelic language and its use. Michael Mara um, suggested that it was a self-congratulatory motion. I, I, I think that's being a bit unkind um, because I've, I've written those self-congratulatory motions, I have to admit, for other debates that him and I have taken <laughs> part in. Um, but genuinely, if this one was self-congratulatory, it was actually congratulating the work that's been done across parties over time on the issue of, of Gaelic um, and Scots. But again, an absolute recognition that there um, is more to do and the consultation is a part um, of that. There is obviously... 
Michael Mara. I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's comments on, on, on that, but I, I would say that there is a real frustration in the Gaelic community, and particularly in the Western Isles, given the current economic turmoil and uh, the fact that if you've ended up with uh, empty sh shelves in the supermarkets, you can't live a life, how are you meant to sustain a community? I think it's that tension that I was hoping to illustrate and to which I would ask the um, Cabinet Secretary to direct her comments. Cabinet Secretary. Um, and it is uh, another um, very important point. Now, I mentioned, I, I, I think he intervened on me, and I mentioned this briefly um, in my introduction to speech about the working group that Kate Forbes um, initiated um, that is looking at, for example, issues around increasing the population in communities, the retention um, of communities, uh, affordable housing, um, transport, the um, increasing use of Gaelic as an economic asset within the area. See, that, that um, working group is due to report uh, this winter, and it is something uh, we will take active look at, but of course recognising uh, the impact of uh, policies right across government um, on uh, this important issue. But I could also uh, pay tribute to the many um, development officers and community officers that there are across Scotland, around 50 um, posts right across Scotland that are creating opportunities for the use of the Gaelic um, language um, that um, is a very important part of our work to recognise uh, that there is uh, a real need to ensure that Gaelic is being used and being encouraged uh, both in uh, public services um, and in the private sector um, in different uh, parts of our community. Uh, Willie Rennie also uh, spoke about the need to, to just get on with it when it comes to the creation of the Gaelic Act. I would suggest if you listen to the debate as we went on, there were different thoughts on this issue um, within our debate. And I, I know already we've had uh, differing views as part of this consultation. So there is a genuine offer in that consultation response to come forward uh, with folks' thoughts um, on the creation of a Gale Act and if that was to happen, uh, where uh, that would um, be. But it is a very important issue for us to look at and get right. Um, Emma Harper uh, spoke, um, as she always does very eloquently um, in Scots, and particularly about Scots words holding up this parliament, and I think that is a very important recognition that we should have. She also mentioned uh, a number of uh, particularly um, young um, authors and those in the arts that promote Scots um, and I'm particularly um, mindful um, of that um, and their work to pr pr promote uh, the Scots language as we move forward. She also spoke about whether we needed a board in the Gaelic equivalent for Scots or whether the Scots Language um, Centre uh, could perhaps fill a similar type of role. And again, I would say the consultation um, is there to, to genuinely look at what would be um, right for Scots, not comparing it to Gaelic, but what is right for Scots. It does suggest uh, building up the use of the Scots Language Centre as an option, uh, but the consultation certainly um, will have, again, I'm sure, a variety um, of views on that, and I would uh, look forward to seeing uh, what people would suggest is the best way forward. Uh, Walter Scott was mentioned uh, by Murdo Fraser, who talked about his knowledge of Scots um, being from school. As I said in my opening speech, I didn't have such a positive um, experience of really being introduced to Scots, apart from one day a year on Burns Day. Now, we again are moving on um, from, from that, uh, thankfully, uh, but it is something, of course, uh, that we still um, need uh, to ensure that we see flourishing um, in all parts of our schools where there is a wish for that to be done. But given um, it is Scottish um, Book Week, um, I will perhaps um, um, take his offer um, of Walter Scott and the importance of that in Scottish literature and also mention a new book by Graham Armstrong, or a reasonably new book by Graham Armstrong, The Young Team, uh, written in Scots, uh, uses uh, Scots, and is an exceptionally important and powerful um, illustration of how Scots can be used um, in a very um, comprehensive way, in a very new manner, on a subject uh, that um, is important to all of us growing up in Scotland. There was also, again, a discussion about Gaelic medium education, and ensuring that that is taking place, where is demand for that um, to happen? Again, the consultation asks genuine questions on that, about whether we've got the balance right 
on Gaelic medium education and about the, the needs of uh, parents having to prove that there is a demand. Um, where should that lie between the role of parents, the role of local authorities um, within that? Again, there will be a variety of views. But his point about how we can uh, attempt to move forward and to see whether what was right when that legislation was passed, perhaps we've moved on and uh, we should be looking at something uh, different at this point um, is a very, very fair one um, and I would certainly expect changes in that area, what that change will be, will be very much up to the consultation uh, responses. Um, Alistair Allen, um, I, I think, uh, outdid us all by obviously doing a speech in Gaelic um, and uh, Scots, uh, again um, showing the importance of uh, using Gaelic as a community language, um, which is exceptionally um, important. And Jackie Dunbar's contribution on Scots really got to uh, the heart of something which is a particular importance to me and that's uh, the use of Scots within education and its um, ability to improve um, young people's um, attainment. Uh, there have been uh, numerous uh, studies uh, that have shown that actually if you provide a young person to see the value of their own language, whether that's Doric, Scots or Gaelic, they gain a better appreciation not just of their own home language, but also their use of English improves, as does their confidence overall. And Cocab Stewart's um, 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 anecdote from her time as a teacher about my wee red motor really did uh, sum that up exceptionally well. I would also um, reassure Rhoda Grant that while we're looking at the consultation, we will very much look at the different needs of Scots and Gaelic. They will be looked at separately. Where those languages are is exceptionally different. What their challenges are is different. And therefore, what the solutions will be will be different. And I recognise also um, the moves by Samuel Rostig to be um, recognised as a small specialist institution. I visited them recently and um, had an exceptionally enjoyable um, time on their campus and I know that they're continuing to work with the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Funding Council's criteria um, on SSIs to see what can be done on that. Uh, there was also a uh, mention oh, by Ariana Burgess and again by Martin Whitfield on what's happening um, in Edinburgh and um, the um, demands for um, a Gaelic medium education secondary um, school. Uh, I met recently um, with uh, the parents um, and found it a very useful and constructive meeting. We've worked with the council to try and find a suitable site. There's nothing within the Scottish government um, um, properties that is of use for that. Um, but I do think, therefore, we need to see early progress by the council and I was disappointed uh, to find out, certainly at the time I'd met the parents, that the City of Edinburgh Council had not met with them since the local government elections. And I have written to the Council to encourage them to do so. Um, there were a number of speakers, um, presiding officer, where I've not had the attention, uh, the, the time to, to give due attention to it in my closing remarks. But I will add uh, a piece of consensus again at the end. As Martin Whitfield said, we have a real opportunity to produce an exceptionally good bill um, and importantly, therefore, the impact that it could have in Gaelic and Scots right across Scotland. That's a very important um, aspect of my role. I thank members today for their contributions and for their suggestions about how we can improve um, our uh, support for Gaelic and Scots and look forward to continuing this debate as the Scots Languages Bill eventually gets to Parliament later in the parliamentary term. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the future of Gaelic and Scots. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 6763.1 in the name of Donald Cameron, which seeks to amend Motion 6763 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the future of Gaelic and Scots, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 6763.2 in the name of Michael Mara, which seeks to amend Motion 6763 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the future of Gaelic and Scots, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. The final question is that Motion 6763 
in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville, as amended, on the future of Gaelic and Scots be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time. We will now move on to members' business, and I'd be grateful if members who are leaving the chamber could please do so quietly.